a very good afternoon to everyone here uh, we have today a wonderful uh, you know uh, series starting on sema a refresh of course on, on sema which is going to span over next 8 days uh, and uh, before we start off with the session and we welcome by our chairman here may i request all to uh, place uh, their hands on their heart for the icci motor song Uh, I recognize the presence of uh, Chairman WRC Manish Gadia here. Uh, my regional council colleague Kamlesh Sabu, our learned faculty for the session Manoj Shah sir and Bhavesh Shah sir, uh, Nidhi, a coordinator and a dear friend. Uh, now uh, we have very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, we have this wonderful refresh of course on FEMA. Uh, which is going to span over eight sessions, and it's going to touch upon every aspect of FEMA. And I really thank uh, uh, you know the faculties here for having structured such a wonderful program and given to us. Uh, so with this, uh, may I touch upon a few things as vice chairman of WRC? May I touch upon a few things, few initiatives that uh, we have we are taking here at WRC. Uh, one is that we have uh, started this portal coach. although the idea was uh, conceived last year itself but uh, it has been rolled out and this is a very good uh, initiative whereby women members uh, can uh, apply for their for jobs on this portal it can be a part time job full time job so they can register themselves on the portal they can spe uh, spe specify what is their field of interest uh, geographical uh, location years of experience several things and then the prospective employers can also register themselves here and then they can shortlist the candidates and the message about you know having shown interest will be sent to the woman uh, ca member and then they can take that communication forward so this is one uh, initiative that we have rolled out now and i uh, request everyone to take best uh, you know help from this portal i am sure it will be highly beneficial to everyone it's a win win for both women cas and all the cas in practice and uh, in corporate sector so that's one the other thing that we have uh, started is we have started with uh, something called you know csr which is basically c is for clinics and under clinics we'll be running all the help desk so currently because there is charitable re registration charitable entities re registration which is the need of the hour we have started a help desk for charitable entities re registration uh, and we will keep on rolling more and more of these types of help desk in times to come depending on the uh, the requirement of that time a uh, specialized series is what we mean by s and this is one of them that you are attending today a wonderful series on fema and we have had on various other topics like in their standards on auditing and several other things Uh, by r we mean uh, representation and reach out so when we get all these inputs on the help desk and even otherwise from members on what are the issues they are facing uh, maybe some ambiguity in some form or something we can then take it forward to the right forum so that the issues can be resolved in time and by doing that we will be really helping members in serving their clients in time 
and they uh, they then there will not be any allegation of you know ca is not being able to meet deadlines so this is one thing that we uh, really want to do and uh, with this may i request uh, chairman wrt uh, to share his vision at this on this platform manisha over to you please thank you rashmi madam and i really thanks uh, especially ca manoj shah for structuring this wonderful series uh, where drushti madam has already said that it will be eight session and complete fema will be covered in the eight session and nowadays india is a part of global economy and cross border transaction are increase very heavily we have seen that every member in the family almost is nri so there are so many cross border transactions happening so lot of opportunities as a while doing audit we are only looking at the income tax or international tax aspect of that but at the same time fema aspect also need to be checked whether it is properly complied or not and there are apart from this there are other various opportunities like compounding the authority enforcement directorate also is there are representing before them so all these opportunities are there as far as fema are concerned and that we can uh, that can be visible from uh, this attendance also in this program we have more than 450 participant enrolled uh, themselves so that shows that the importance of fema has now increased quickly i will go about uh, some of the initiative what wirc took during last 2 3 2 2 and a half month uh, first we have tied up with 10 different hospital for covid vaccination on a priority basis again the members or their family members who are in quarantine uh, and covid positive not able to make food at home so we have started a facility of delivery of meal at their doorstep this time our focus will be more on series like fema series what we are doing but apart from that regular series is package series we have started that is on every third thursday of the month we have any program on technology this 18th may we are going to launch another series that is learning from legends where you will get an opportunity to hear a legend and learn from that his life experience month end also we are going to launch ceo speak a journey from chartered accountant to ceo so the opportunity mm. for ca is not only restricted to accounting finance taxation but he can run a business also and that also life experience we are going to see in this series apart from that on 14th may on uh, akshay tritya and ramzan eid auspicious day we are going to launch another initiative that is called tel train earn and learn where we will give training to undergraduate student of a college and then place them with the ca office where they will get some practical training so earning while learning that is what the concept ta so any chartered accountant firm who are looking for this kind of trained undergraduate staff can write to us at wirc@ici.in the first batch of this course may come somewhere in first week of june apart from that next month we are going to launch a long duration course on technology that will be on data analytics using sql python then tableau power bi presentation etc that what we are going to launch this sunday we are going to launch wirc wellness series keeping in mind you have various myths various doubt about the covid so that we are going to clear in 3 4 series mentorship program also has been launched so those who want to be mentor can register themselves as well as mentees also can register themselves on a wirc portal another new initiative what we have started is of updating members on real time basis we will upload a short very short video of 2 to 3 minutes whenever a update will come immediately So those who are interested can subscribe to YouTube channel of WIRC, and whenever a new update will come, you will get the C 
same. So these are the few initiatives. I am not going into the detailing what webinar or seminar we are doing yet. You can check on our website. So thank you very much to all the members, and I also thank T.A. Kamlesh Sabu, the chairman of Economic and Commercial Law Committee, for uh, organizing this wonderful uh, series. Over to you, Dusty Mehta. Thank you, Manish Bhai, for sharing your vision. Uh, about, now, may I request uh, Kambi Sabu, uh, my regional council colleague, to introduce the faculty for the first session, PM Manoj Shah. Thank you, Drishti Madam, and uh, thanks to Manish Bhai. And uh, I'm really happy to say the profile of CM Manoj Bhai Shah. Manoj Shah is qualified a child accountant in the year 1987, and is a founder partner of the firm Sai and Moody Chartered Accountants. His focus area of practice are exchange control regulations, that is FEMA, international taxes and, and transfer pricing. He is past president of the Chamber of Tax Consultant and past president of CVA, CVOC Association. Presently, he is assistant editor of the monthly journal of the Chamber, that is the Chamber's journal. He contributes to the FEMA update column of news that are published by Western India Regional Council of ICI and to the general publish of the ICI in New Delhi. His contribution to the publications include interest in taxation, a compendium, third edition published by the Chamber of Tax Consultants, FEMA in reference of WIRC, referencer of FEMA, a publication of the ICI. He is co-author of publications, tax withholding from payments to non-residents published by the Chamber of Tax Consultants. He is technical reviewer of the publication titled FEMA Compo Compoundium Orders, a comprehensive analysis. He has delivered talks on FEMA and non-resident taxation at seminar conferences at various forums across India. And I would say that he is an ocean of knowledge of this topic. Now, every participant is requested to take a dive into it and enhance their knowledge. With this, I am presenting here the Manoj Vaisa in front of all of you and over to this Madam to take the further chart. Thank you. Thank you, Kamlesh Bhai. So now we start off with the first session on history and relevance and structure, sources of legislation and physically capital and current account transactions by PA Manoj Bhai. Uh, Manoj Bhai, over to you, please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Drishti Madam, uh, Chairman Manish Ji, Kamlesh, Nidhi, Bhavesh, and all the attendees on this virtual uh, series on FEMA. I am glad that you know uh, the response to the seminar is good. Even though chairman had requested us to you know uh, design the program, and we are really happy with the kind of response that we have received. Of course, this is a very tough time so far as we all are concerned on our health front, our uh, social front, and even for our nation. But uh, it is glad to know that we are able to capitalize this time for studies and we are able to develop our skills on that wherever possible. As uh, chairman has rightly pointed out, uh, you know, uh, that uh, FEMA otherwise is a regulatory law like uh, SEBI and Corporate Law or Companies Act or Competition Commission Act. And But uh, the application of FEMA has otherwise widely increased over the last 20, 30 years because uh, post-1991 when India has opened up its economy and a lot of foreign investments have come in. And with the mobility of intellectual capital across the globe happening so speedily uh, that uh, there is a concept or maybe you can say that the community of non-resident Indian uh, again in the entire universe is increasing day by day and therefore there is a lot of cross-border transition, cross-border investment and therefore one has to be aware of what are the regulatory laws dealing with uh, this type of uh, uh, transaction and the first and foremost is the foreign nation management act so let's uh, you know uh, run through this uh, fema to get the overview of fema and thereafter we will have specific sessions uh, on fema which will give you an in-depth analysis of the particular topics say for example the next topic itself is uh, foreign direct investment in india the FDI which is coming into India and that will be taken up by Parish Bhai. So now uh, looking at the uh, structure of the FEMA, or I just go back to the first slide. Uh, Vaibo, can you go to first slide? Yeah, so sorry. Huh. So it is basically, it is applying to whole of India. It has just 49 sections. So if you look at the FEMA, you know, otherwise it's a very thin piece of legislation. 
and uh, comprising of only 49 sections and in last 20 years uh, since this introduction uh, there are hardly any changes in the act so act is otherwise uh, very static uh, except few changes like introduction of section 37a or changes in the Reserve Bank of India's power to administer certain uh, capital account transaction. Uh, I think it has not undergone very much change. But I'll explain you the structure of MI and why it is at times becoming difficult to comprehend. So we will run through that. But otherwise, just to uh, keep this thing in mind that it is a very thin piece of legislation. Uh, section 37a of the FEMA is uh, giving a power to the regulator to seize equivalent value of assets you know if they can seize the equivalent of assets which are otherwise there's a contravention and the person is not available in india or is not able to uh, bring back the foreign exchange or overseas assets then you know the section 37 a gives power to uh, seize equivalent assets in india it is something you know uh, akin to the power which is available in fugitive economic offenders act of 2018 uh, the only care to be taken here is that you know the uh, the section is very very uh, rigorous uh, the scope of and the the scope is too big into say in the sense that even if there is a suspicion in the minds of regulator that there is you know some assets which is held outside india they can trigger section 37 a then you have regulatory uh, section it is a delegated piece of legislation and uh, reserve bank of india is implementing authority and section 46 and 47 grants power to reserve bank and uh, even after the changes in certain capital account transaction which we shall see later rbi is interest, interested with administration and implementation now we look at the uh, structure of PEMA. so it is as we mentioned the there is an act and then there are notifications you have rules you have master directions you have apdr circulars which is authorized persons uh, dr circulars and your faq so while act is a very thin piece of legislation notifications are the crux of PEMA. so for example i just draw a corollary or with the income tax act to make you understand that uh, in under income tax act you will find that you know uh, there is a chapter 17 on tds or chapter 4d for business profit profit and gains of business and profession so everything is comprised in one piece of uh, act and you have different divisions here is a case where you have act which is very thin but for every transaction which could be capital account transaction or current account transaction and there are attempts certain regulatory or procedural aspects for every such uh, requirement there is a notification and each notification is a kind of self-contained code that notification can have its own definitions in addition to the definitions which are given under FEMA Act. And these notifications otherwise undergo a very, very quick change. So unlike uh, Income Tax Act, again to draw analogy, to say that you know the major changes would take place through finance bill and every year you have 1st of February where you know you will be given with the finance bill and there will be major changes in the Income Tax Act. Uh, FEMA does not have such system. It is, does not have annual day for carrying out changes depending upon the changes in the economy and wherever required you know reserve bank of india will take due care and it will come out with notifications or apds circulars uh, then there are rules basically the rules uh, certain rules to deal with or uh, gives guidance for example for current account transition there are rules if for compounding of contravention there is a guideline and it is captured in the rules uh, the next piece of uh, legislation within fema is master directions uh, master directions is nothing but a compilation of entire uh, directions of Reserve Bank of India, which it wants the bankers or authorized dealers and in turn the persons undertaking foreign exchange transition, how they will be undertaking such transition. The entire guidance is given in master direction. So notifications and master directions are otherwise in a, you can put in the same category of basket. But notification is a, has got a legal banking. It is published through government through procedures, whereas master directions is exclusive prerogative of Reserve Bank of India. And it is bit in simpler in language. So uh, APDI circulars, which is kind of uh, circulars which are issued to bankers or authorized persons who are undertaking foreign exchange transactions. And this APDI circulars are on 24 seven, that is real time basis are captured in master direction. So if you look at the master direction on foreign direct investment, you will come across entire piece of uh, circulars which are comprised and whatever changes are taking place through APDI circular, those will be captured in master directions. Earlier, the master directions were uh, uh, the preceding, you can say the preceding version of master direction was master circulars. But since last uh, 
couple of years the circulars have given a go by and the terminology now is a master direction one of the reason to give the terminology from circulars to direction could be that you know section 13 of PEMA, which deals with uh, penalty provisions it says that contravention of act notifications and even directions of reserve bank of india will amount to contravention and therefore you cannot say that you know it is a directions uh, i mean it, it is a circular which is not binding on the uh, constituents undertaking the fema and then you have faqs for better understanding so this is the kind of structure for fema uh, this is a bit summary of the sections of fema act so you have section one then you have section two which is usually definition section section three to nine are substantial provision one can say and it is, these are the provisions which are relating to uh, management of foreign exchange then you have section 10 to 12 which deals with the provisions related to authorized person uh, section 13 to 15 is provisions related to contravention and penalties and 16 to 38 with respect to adjudication appeal and then you have miscellaneous provisions uh as we discuss about notification so initially you know when uh, reserve bank had uh, come out with this uh, notifications uh there those were 25 notifications were there uh later on uh this uh, notifications have undergone change and uh, this notifications have undergone change and the now the new notifications which are there are given in the form of uh, r that is you know the revised notification will carry a suffix r so out of 25 notifications, the 15 notifications were relating to capital account transaction, one notification which dealt with export on goods and services, and there were nine for other procedural aspects. So as I mentioned that, you know, notification is the, uh, again, the substantial piece of legislation within FEMA, and these notifications have undergone changes. And in fact, the, if you look at the old version, the initial 25 notifications would have gone to uh, something like 380, 390 notifications. As I mentioned that, you know, FEMA cannot be a static law. It keeps on changing with the changing place in economy and the, even the international scenario, wherever it is impacting India on foreign exchange, it will come out with some sort of directions and notifications. And this is the link where uh, you can look at the FEMA notifications. Uh, then you have a master direction, which I have already dealt with, you know, this is a uh, uh, direction which consolidate the instructions or rules on a particular subject and uh, as i mentioned they are updated on a real-time basis and 19 directions have been issued and this is the link where you can access the master directions then you have authorized persons directions so this is nothing but you know uh, the circulars I, I am using the terminology circulars but these are directions which are issued to authorized persons so Reserve Bank of India has in turn delegated the implementation of FEMA to authorized persons. Authorized persons are the persons who are allowed to deal in foreign exchange. So they only can deal in foreign exchange. The rest of the person like, you know, its citizens or corporate citizens, they cannot deal in foreign exchange. We'll see that uh, things later, which is very interesting. So basically to say that, you know, the foreign exchange buying and selling or, you know, uh, undertaking any transaction can be done only through authorized persons. And that's what is the uh, meaning of the circular. So to, through this circular, that is APDA circular, Reserve Bank, in addition to modifying the notification, this will come out with circulars and which will be giving a guidance uh, to the uh, person who are undertaking foundation transition of what, the, what are the changes. And these are the circulars which are again binding not only on the uh, authorized person, but also on the person undertaking the transition. So unlike income tax, where one would say that the circulars are binding only on CBDT, but not on taxpayer, and taxpayer can have, or SSC can have a different view, that is not possible here. Uh, it equally applies to the person undertaking the transition, and contravention of even the circular pending the issuance of notification can also lead to contravention of FEMA, and section 13 then will be applicable what with whatever panel provisions or compounding provisions and the legal validity of this circular has been upheld in the case of professor krishna raj goswami and uh, so this is the apda circulars yeah coming to the yeah pre preamble to the frame and this is very which is philosophically one has to understand you know what are the uh, things which has to come in and bear in mind Weibo, I am not able to read my full screen. So, can I close this? Can you close this part? Okay. 
this right hand side maybe you know this yeah yeah now now it is fine yeah so this is a preamble to the fema it says that an act to consolidate and amend the law relating to foreign exchange with the objective of facilitating external trade and payments aid for promoting the orderly development and maintenance of foreign exchange market in india so this is the preamble and this preamble has a got a drastic change if you look at the uh, the predecessor act of uh, dealing with foreign exchange which was foreign exchange regulation act which was the act of 1973 and this is the preamble under the fema so basically you are looking at uh, as a reserve bank is not only acting as a regulator but as a facilitator to you know promoting external trade and payments so the process of you know turning from regulator to a facilitator began from 1991 when you know india opened up its economy and since 1991 till 1999 even though on a as a legislation we had fema fera sorry my uh, i beg your pardon it was foreign exchange regulation act but as the reserve bank used to come out with liberalized measure through circulars and those time the circulars instead of apdr those were known as adma circular and those adma circulars were you know issued to in a piecemeal manner to say that you know we are opening up our economy we will be allowing foreigners to come in we will be allowing foreign portfolio investor to invest in stock market in india and stuff like that so from 1991 due to foreign exchange crisis you know which uh, had to you know come in play and therefore we had to open up our economy and since then from 1991 to 1999 even though fera was in place the liberalization took place through uh this sort of circulars but however a need was felt that you know th there has to be commensurate law but you cannot uh, come out with circulars every time whereas your uh, the main piece of legislation ha has something else the objectives are not in matching or not in gel with what is the your intention and therefore in 1999 we came out with a foreign exchange management act which gave a kind of regulatory approach to a facilitator approach uh there are certain you know important definitions under section 2 of fema but i request uh, those who want to study fema they must run through the entire uh, text of uh, you know the definitions which are given for some of the definitions which i am taking here will just give you an idea so it defines foreign currency it says foreign currency means any currency other than indian currency then you have foreign exchange so foreign currency and foreign exchange are different terms you have foreign exchange means foreign currency so in addition to foreign currency it says it includes deposits credits credits and balances payable in any foreign currency draft travelers checks letters of credits or bills of exchange expressed or drawn in indian currency but payable in foreign currency drafts or bills of exchange drawn by banks institutions or person outside india but payable in indian currency so you know it it is in not in just a foreign currency or you know travelers check but even the you know letters of credit bills of exchange everything which has the potential of either creating foreign exchange liability in the sense that you have to remit something or you have to receive something in from non resident from abroad uh, it will be regarded as a foreign exchange I am unable to move slides, Vibha. Next one. Yeah. So continuing with the definition, you have next definition which is repatriate to India. So now I am just running out this, reading out this definition. I will try to see, but when we come to section eight of uh, FEMA, which is there in this next few slides, and you will, I'll be able to exactly convey the importance of this definition. So you have repatriate to India, and it is defined. it says it means bringing into india the realized foreign exchange and the selling of such foreign exchange to an authorized person in india in exchange for rupees or the holding of the realized amount in an account with an authorized person in india to the extent notified by reserve bank now what does this mean so as a student of fema you have to bear one thing in mind that foreign exchange just for the our, our sake of understanding assume that it is a uh, it is a commodity or it is a product and the monopoly to deal in the product lies with government government in turn has given power to reserve bank reserve bank in turn has given power to authorized person so foreign exchange is a different commodity it's a product and only person who can deal in the foreign exchange are bankers or authorized persons 
which are appointed by Reserve Bank of India. So therefore, now you look at the definition of repatriate to India. What it says that is, suppose there is an exporter from India. He has exported some uh, services, which is it's a software development services, an Indian company, which is a outsourcing unit. It has exported services to a US company. Now it has raised an invoice of say $1 million on a US company. So now it is an obligation of the exporter to bring back the foreign exchange to India. And you say when you say bringing back the foreign exchange to India, it will the terminology which is used here is repatriate to India. It means bringing into India the realized foreign exchange. So having raised the invoice, it is the duty of the Indian exporter to realize the foreign exchange. When you say what do you mean by realize and what do you mean by repatriate? Realize means taking a control that you know you have made an attempt that you know now your dues are say for example this invoice of one million dollar was payable after 30 days. That means on 30th day it has been realized and now it is the obligation of the Indian exporter to repatriate it to India. Having repatriate to India what are you going to do with foreign exchange? As I told you it's a commodity and exclusive powers have been granted to only authorized persons to deal in that. Therefore, now what do you mean by repatriation? It says that having realized the foreign exchange and selling of such foreign exchange to an authorized person in exchange for rupees. So it is compulsorily the person who is realizing the foreign exchange, it will have to sell the foreign exchange to authorized person, not to anyone else, only to authorized person. Or holding of realized amount in an account with an authorized person. So either Reserve Bank has given a facilitative depending upon the comfortable position of foreign exchange resource that Indian economy has today, that you can retain certain part or full amount of ex the export earnings into EEFC account, exchange earners foreign currency account. So, but obligation is, you know, to bring it back to India. You cannot hold it overseas. If you wish to hold it overseas, you require some approval. So the concept is that, you know, you have to repatriate to India. So foreign exchange is a commodity or a product or it's an exclusive right to deal in foreign exchange is granted only to authorized person. And therefore, every Indian, be it individual or every Indian resident will have to bring back such foreign exchange and which is known as a repatriate to India. There's also a definition of repatriate outside India, but it is not given in the FEMA Act. It was given in the erstwhile notification of FEMA 21, which was dealing with uh, acquisition of immoral properties in, in India. Uh, those who are interested may, you know, read out that definition, but this was the concept. Now, this is the what we discuss is actually given a legal sanctity by Section 8 of FEMA. The Section 8 of FEMA has a title Realization and Repatriation of Foreign Exchange. It says, save as otherwise provided in this act, where any amount of foreign exchange is due or has accrued to any person resident in India, such person shall take all reasonable steps to realize and repatriate to India such foreign exchange within such period and such manner as may be prescribed by Reserve Bank. So, same as otherwise provided in that, where any amount of foreign exchange is due or has accrued. So, something like Section 5 of Income Tax Act, which says that for resident income, not only income which is arising, accruing or received in India, but across the globe, entire global income is taxable. And what the term which is used in Section 5? Accrued or, you know, it has accrued or it has been, uh, I think, arising or accruing or arising. That is the term used there. And what Section 8 of FEMA uses the form? terms it is due or as accrued so again foreign exchange is the monopoly of government what it says that you know where any amount of foreign exchange is due or is accrued to any person resident in india moment there is a person who is resident in india and he has earned foreign exchange which is due or as accrued to him such person shall take all reasonable steps to realize Realize means taking control of the foreign exchange. You will get your foreign exchange which is due you will have to take all reasonable steps to realize and then repatriate to India such foreign exchange within such period. So as on date, you know, for example, for export, maybe it is nine months. I'm not exactly aware for to the before uh, this pandemic, it was nine months, but maybe it is not 12 months or 15 months depending. So within such period and such manner. So you also cannot realize repatriate foreign exchange in the manner you want that somebody is coming from overseas and you say that, you know, you carry travel check from my customer and you bring it and uh, you hand it over to me. No, that's not. So Reserve Bank will prescribe the manner of realization also. And this is very strict. You, you, if you are, if you are even realizing and repatriating foreign exchange, but not in the manner in which Reserve Bank wants, again, it will lead to contradiction. 
so this is what is the importance so i hope that you know this is what you have to bear in mind that that is the importance of foreign exchange now the realization repatriation and foreign exchange and you know there have been time and again there have been discussion that india should now uh, try to approach or move towards the full convertibility or you know try to relax this foreign nation because today we are sitting on a very comfortable foreign nation position and therefore there should be a possibility that you know this uh, the law relating to foreign exchange and such a strict law that you know how you will realize in what manner you will realize within what time frame you will realize you just scrap the law and you say that you know the resident indians are free to deal in foreign nation there should be in a way kind of scrapping of fema but uh, there have been papers presented uh, one of the paper which was presented by tarapur committee and it presented paper twice i believe in 2001 2 and again in 2000 maybe 7 or 8 for a path to leading to full convertibility as we call uh, but the international economic events you know which took place during those times were such severe and had really uh, the india's approach or reserve bank's approach of this maintaining foreign exchange management act and rules and regulation proved to be a very wise decision and therefore india could save itself from the layman crisis of 2008 or late 90s crisis where southeast asian economy had very uh, tumbled you know like thailand or malaysia uh, where a lot of issues were there so both these events of 2008 uh, Lehman Brothers kind of financial crisis, you know, which even didn't spare UAE and some of the developed nations, uh, the time and again the talk about liberalizing the foreign exchange or converting, offering full convertibility of foreign exchange has again failed. And you know, uh, we are as on date also we have got this foreign exchange management act, and therefore one has to deal with it. Now we touch upon very important aspect of uh, concept of residence. So under FEMA, there is a concept of residence which is of uh, two types. Uh, you have got uh, person resident in India and person resident outside India. So the term not resident or non-resident or NRI is not used here. It is person resident in India and person resident outside India. There is even third category of uh, person which is not permanently resident in India, something like resident but not ordinary resident what we have under income tax. But this is not under the FEMA Act, which is the main piece of legislation. So under the current account rules, there is a concept and they say that person resident, but not permanently resident in India. So this is one concept which is there, one has to bear in mind, but otherwise primarily there are only two uh, person resident in India and person resident outside India. Even though person resident, but not permanently resident in India, by and large, that person will also be regarded as a person resident in India, only that such person enjoys certain facility with respect to certain foreign exchange which is earning outside india we'll see later uh, under fera the citizenship was considered as a deciding factor where a citizenship is not a deciding factor under fema the fema lays emphasis on residing which denotes permanency and the definition of resident is silent uh, regarding student but the citizenship is not given any importance and the physical stay in india or one would say the residing which denotes a permanency so FEMA says, you know, whether you are residing in India or not, your citizenship doesn't matter. So therefore, a U.S. citizen, a pure white Firangi person, you know, coming to India and if he is residing in India or his intention is to stay in India, he will become resident of India. This is the definition, which is a very objective definition trying to give, uh, is giving, uh, but it has created a lot of confusion after even 20 years of, you know, it is remaining in existence. There are certain issues, you know, which leads to a lot of confusion at times under FEMA for uh, person resident in India or resident outside India. Uh, what it says, so it is 2V1 of FEMA, which says that person who is residing in India for more than 182 days during the preceding financial year. So you have to look at preceding financial year, not the relevant accounting year or previous year or financial year. You will go back to preceding financial year and you will see whether it is he was in India for one or two days or more. But it says it does not include. So otherwise you are a person resident in India, but and you were there in India in the preceding financial year. So say financial year uh, 2021. I am looking at 21 22. I'll go back to 2021 and say that you know, I was in India for more than one or two days. Therefore, I am resident in of India under FEMA. But it says no, if you are going out of India or staying outside India for the purpose of taking up employment, for carrying business or vocation, 
or for any other purpose in such circumstances as would indicate his intention to stay outside India for uncertain period, such person will be regarded as person resident outside India under the law. So even though I was there in India for more than 182 days in the preceding financial year, but this three category of you know uh, movement or persons uh, going outside India for employment, business, or any circumstances which is says that you know he has intention to stay outside India for uncertain period, it will lead to person becoming non-resident under FEMA. So first two categories are clear that you know employment and even carrying of business or vocation. But how you will determine that you know person has left India for business or vocation? Is it so that you know simply going outside India for my business exploratory tour or for expansion of business or for meeting purposes? You know, will it amount to person becoming non-resident under family if I am there outside India for more than 182 days? Or because of COVID, I am there. Will it amount to my becoming non-resident under family? Then you will look at the visa status. You will look at the exact visa on what kind of visa this person has traveled. If you're looking at employment, you will always have a, always have an employment visa of that respective country. If you're looking at business or vocation, it is not the business visa, but usually you will find that you are trying to shift to another country with permanent residency visa over there. Like, like for example, Canada today is inviting a lot of uh, young people out of across the globe because Canada is facing a situation where in next 20, 15, 20 years, if they do not invite the young population between 18 to 45, the senior citizens, uh, you know, population in Canada will be too big a number. And therefore, you know, as a uh, future planning, you know, they've already started giving a lot of incentives and a lot of them ease the rules for, you know, persons set, trying to settle in Canada. And therefore, you will find that, you know, you have, somebody has gone there on a permanent residency visa. So if, some, if that is the intention which will be reflected based on visa. So visa will be an important document to understand and to determine what is the intention of person for living outside India. The third category of such person in such circumstances as would indicate it intention to stay outside India. So this intention will be reflected through your course of action or some, you know, say for example, uh, just to give you an idea that, you know, a couple from India after marriage had gone to New Zealand for honeymoon. And the, it was a doctor couple and, you know, they, uh, once they were there, they liked the country so much that, you know, they kept on increasing their uh, visa, which was a kind of a leisure visa or holiday visa or, you know, uh, tourist visa and this they kept on increasing the stay in New Zealand and uh, almost maybe a year had gone there and thereafter they came India for a short duration and then you know, packed everything and lock stock and barrel they thought that you know will now opt for permanent residency and our intention is therefore to now settle in New Zealand so when you are looking at such type of circumstances so you de depending upon the facts you know it will give you clear indication that what is the intention of the person in such there are take other way case there are people who sometimes who are person resident outside India, foreigners, non-resident, they come to India for certain Ayurveda treatment, for certain health treatment, which are ailments, you know, which natural in natural way through naturopathy or some other such alternative medicines are being treated and Kerala is a big center for that. Sometimes we have seen that, you know, people, you know, they like the treatment, the country and, you know, the environment so much that they think of, you know, settling here. They later on they call their family, you know, and they try to settle here. So these are the indication and intention will reflect, and this is a very open category to determine the residential status. So this was about you know person becoming non-resident. Now it again says you know the resident in India, and there is another negative point. It says that I'm I'm reading definition again now on the second bullet. Person resident in India means residing in India for more than 182 days during the course of preceding financial year, but does not include. A person coming to India or staying in in India otherwise. So if somebody has come to India, okay, okay, and if he is not coming for employment, if he is not coming for business or vocation or for uncertain period, then you know he will not be regarded as a resident of India. Now this confusion arises because of the second part. You know that I am somebody is coming to India and what is the status? He is in India for more than 182 days. Should I be treating him as resident compulsory? So this is where, you know, I'll just go to next slide and we'll see that, you know, the, the, your confusion will, I'm trying to, you know, kind of clarity, give up some sort of clarification. Uh, person resident outside India is defined in 2W and it is negatively defined. It says that person who is not a resident of India is person resident outside India. Now, 
unlike now let's again understand this definition because this is very crucial and you have to be clear with respect to this definition so therefore understand this from income tax perspective also and trying to there make our understanding a bit simpler so it says unlike income tax wherein the residential status of a person is determined only on the basis of physical stay in india under FEMA, it is the intention of leaving india or coming to india determines the residential status so what it says when you're looking at this definition coming to india or staying in india otherwise than for so if i'm coming to india for employment or for business or vocation then from my intention is to come to india therefore i'll become resident so even though i was not in india for preceding in preceding financial year for more than 182 days but if i'm coming in india for the purpose of employment for with something like permanent residency visa of india and i'm come to india for carrying business or vocation from that very day from that very year that very day rather not year i'll become resident under FEMA and let's see how this is happening so definition does not refer to physical stay in india and the better view therefore is intention prevails over physical stay so my view you know when deciding the residential state especially for person coming to india and they have not stayed in india for more than 182 days in the preceding financial year and if that person is coming to india for employment or for business or vocation my view is that he despite he being not in india for more than 182 days his status under fema would become resident and of course there is some sort of controversy even among the fema experts also that you know because the definition itself clearly says that you should be in india for more than 182 days in the preceding financial year and therefore physical stay condition is not fulfilled and in view of that if person is coming into india for employment or business or vocation unless he fulfills this physical stay condition he should not be regarded as a resident during that financial year but my view is different i am saying that in the immediate year of taking up employment with india or in india not with india but in india and setting up business or vocation on pr visa you will amount to resident and let's see where Reserve bank also tries to emphasize that intention will prevail over physical state so i'm giving this reference it's a reference to fema notification which emphasizes intention now we i'm i'm touching upon a paragraph 7 of schedule 1 of fema notification 5r which is a deposit regulation it deals with nre deposit non-resident external account non-resident nr or nre fcnr account and what it says to say uh, which emphasizes the intention the point which i'm trying to drive it says nre accounts should be redesignated as resident accounts or funds held may be transferred to rfc accounts immediately upon return to india for taking up employment or for carrying on business or for any other purpose indicating intention to stay in now here you are not saying that you know you will wait for 182 days to get over in the relevant financial year of my coming to india and thereafter in the next financial year you know uh, you will tell me the now stop your nre and other account immediately it says immediately upon return to india and that's what is the correct position of law i believe you know because under fema your intention will prevail over your physical stay and therefore if my intention is to come back permanently to india for example there is an uh, nri or oci you know uh, non-resident indian or overseas citizen of india who are allowed to have such account nre or uh, uh, fcnr account and if they come to india with the intention to settle in india uh, immediately upon the return they should do this exercise of you know converting redesignating the account which are held to nre to rfc or converted to normal ordinary account and here also there with respect to again emphasizing the intention they are saying what do you mean by visit to india it's the same para states that where account holder is on a short visit to india the account may continue as nre even during his stay in india now they have not defined objectively what do you mean by short visit but again this again gives an indication that what is important is your intention if intention to stay in india from the day one in my view person becomes resident of india now, where is the relevance of physical stay? So, physical stay of more than 102 days in the preceding financial year is only relevant for acquisition of immobile property by foreign nations other than overseas citizens of India. Now, while dealing with FEMA, one has to bear in mind few things. That if you are looking at person resident outside India, which is a broad category, divide person resident outside India into Again, three subcategories. Sub One is non resident India. Other is overseas citizen of India. And third is foreign national. And fourth category could be non living person, you know, not a natural person, like it could be a 
एल एल पी ओवरसीज कंपनी और आर्टिफिशियल जूरिटिकल पर्सन वॉट एवर सो यू कैन डिवाइड इंटू फोर कैटेगरीज पर्सन एट सीन एट आउटसाइड इंडिया वी आर डिवाइडिंग इंटू फोर कैटेगरीज एन आर आई ओ सी आई फॉरन नेशनल एंड नॉन इंडिविजुअल्स विच वुड इंक्लूड ऑल एंटिटीज एंड बिजनेस एंटिटीज Why this difference is necessary? Because there is a change with respect to every treatment which NRI will have, and certain treatment which OCI will have, and certain treatment which foreign national will have. And therefore, make sure that person with whom you are dealing, or you are coming for any advice, you know, whether he is a citizen of India and residing outside India, if he continues to be citizen of India but residing outside India, he is a non-resident India. He is still on Indian passport. okay he still has a right to vote in india whereas another category is overseas citizen of india so therefore either this person now as on date is not holding indian passport he might be in his uh, uh, you know earlier part of his life he would be resident of india holding indian passport but having migrated overseas say us uk he would have surrendered indian citizenship and he would have taken citizenship of uk us maybe so therefore he becomes oc citizen of india and the generation next to him will also be regarded as oci there are separate rules who will be regarded as oc citizen of india but this is oci category then third category is foreign national person who are neither nri nor oci but they are foreign nationals you know and therefore the rules he will a person resident out in india but there could be some difference in rules and treatment under prema and fourth category is uh, non individuals so this is how you will have to deal and then try to apply prema now with respect to physical stay what it says you know why my title of this slide says that you know acquisition of immobile property by foreign nationals other than oci so you are a foreign national but you are not oci so it's the press release of government which says that you know it is a very old press release which is of 2009 it says that it uh, we are advising it's a government's advice on acquiring land by person resident outside india in case of foreign nationals physical condition to stay for more than 182 days is mandatory for buying of immobile property as resident and of course your intention has to be established and travel related documents and nature of visa will establish intention of the person that is what the government's ministry says i mean central government uh, press release says now it is not issued by reserve bank of india again it is issued by central government now why this press release is there and how it helps us to understand is that the by dealing with acquisition of immobile property now we know that under para citizenship was given importance whereas under prema citizenship has got no relevance therefore a foreign national coming to india and he says that you know i am in india for employment or i am in india for business or vocation and therefore i am a resident moment he becomes resident prema does not apply to him at all if prema does not apply to him at all and he starts buying properties in india whether he is whether prema can have some implication or not and therefore it says that such foreign nationals mind well i am using the term only foreign national not nri or oci only foreign nationals if they wish to buy property you know they will have to fulfill the physical condition and not only that your intention so there were cases where you know lot of uh, properties were acquired by foreign nationals in goa and other parts of the country you would know through a lot of news items that you know a lot of russians had bought properties in goa they had set up some companies in india in the guise of foreign direct investment and then they started buying properties and even there were direct purchases of property they claimed that you know we are in india we are in uncertain period and we want to buy the property and therefore this direction for this press release has come so for the purpose of buying a property by foreign nationals you will have to establish your physical condition stay because nri and oci even while they are not resident indian or even they are overseas citizen of india and they are not resident under prema in terms of a definition they can still buy immobile property in india in the form of residential or commercial properties and even uh, certain other categories of property except for agricultural land plantation or farm house you know they can buy so therefore the relevance of buying property by foreigners arises only in case of foreign nationals and the laws even after liberalization of laws you know india has still maintained that you know we will not allow foreign nationals to buy real estate in india okay so that is what the law is now we come to the uh, third category which is again as i mentioned it is not flowing from the fema act but through current account rules and that is residential status under fema person resident but not permanently resident and this terminology is given under schedule 3 of current account rules it says that a person resident in india so you are by your own nature you are person resident in india on account of his employment or deputation of a specified duration 
irrespective of length thereof or for a specific job or assignment the duration of which does not exceed three years is considered to be a person resident but not permanently resident in india this is more in the nature of facility available being a resident but not permanently resident in india means a person is a resident of india even his bank account is resident account so you are coming to india a foreign national assume for a while that you know uh, microsoft uh, sends one of his uh, employee on a deputation into india and he says that you know you will be there in india for up to three years now he is coming to india on employment he is going to be appointed or he is going to work as an employee of microsoft india private limited and therefore he fulfills the condition he becomes he is on employment he's on employment visa and as per the intention is to stay in india and therefore he becomes resident of india but his duration is of specific duration which is uh, irrespective of length and therefore if he's for a specific duration he can call himself to be person resident but not permanently resident in india and we'll see what are the different facilities that he enjoys and if you are coming for a specific job or assignment without any term but if the, the, that term is that specific job is not exceeding three years he will still can be regarded as a person resident but not permanently resident in india a person resident but not permanently resident in india enjoys following facility such person can make remittance up to net salary after deduction of taxes or contribution to labor laws as per provident fund and other things as per explanation now what do you mean by this make remittance see as i told you that today a person resident in india we know that you know foreign exchange is the commodity or a product which is exclusively dealt in by government and government through reserve bank reserve bank through authorized person so today if i want to buy a foreign exchange for either for my travel purpose or for any other purpose you know i have to go to bank i have to go to authorized person and say i want to i want some dollars take this rupee and give me some dollars okay now here is a case where this gentleman in our example which was an employee of microsoft india private limited he came to, he came to india and he is in india as a resident of india but he wants to remit his salary because he has got his emis which are going uh, for his home i mean wherever he was staying his family is also there and therefore he needs to remit money to his home country now naturally if he has earned salary in india and paid by indian company it will be as a resident to resident transition it cannot be in foreign nation therefore this salary will be in rupee so he earns a salary of say 1 million rupee a month and he wants to now remit to so this facility or this status says that you can remit entire net salary so after deduction of taxes whatever is you know salary he can remit to his home country so this is a kind of facility which is given to him then we look at another aspect of this which is regulation 4 of notification 11 which talks about possession and retention of foreign currency it says that person resident but not permanently resident in india can possess foreign currency i'm using the word foreign currency and not foreign exchange without any limit provided such foreign currency was owned by him when he was non-resident and has been brought into india in accordance with the family so when you are bringing you are coming to india and you are carrying some foreign currency worth say fifty thousand dollars you know otherwise there is a restriction on how much foreign currency you can hold because other things it has to be in electronic money in the credit card or travelers check or something like that but if this is a person who is coming and he is qualifies to be person resident but not permanent resident in india he can continue to own whatever foreign currency which he brought while coming to india continuing with this status you know an entity in india may remit pa for pension in respect of expatriate staff who are resident but not permanent resident in india they are also defining expat means a person whose pa for pension fund is maintained outside india by his principal employer outside india and he can remit his pf there such person who is not permanently resident may purchase a foreign security from out of his foreign currency resources outside india now you are saying that you know the same case of microsoft and if there is a person in india who is working as an employee of microsoft india now prior to that he was working in microsoft us and he was granted some ESOP or he wants to buy some security you know from his foreign savings which is lying in his home country so called home country i would say uh, uh, say that you know it is lying there and he wants to buy foreign security can he do so otherwise for resident indian you know you'll have to use that 
popularly what we call liberalized remittance scheme which is there for two lakh fifty thousand dollar and i'll go to my bank i'll file a2 form and then you know carry out this transition of remitting money overseas to my broker's account and then buy the security what it says here is that since i have a foreign exchange resource or my own money lying there and i want to buy the security this provision which is otherwise applicable to resident will not apply to person resident but not permanent resident in india the last point is relaxed remittances facility as stated above will apply to you know one citizen of foreign state other than pakistan and even to indian citizen who is on a deputation to the office or branch of subsidiary of joint venture so the idea was to you know make you understand about the concept of resident but not permanent resident in india now we look at another interesting aspect of you know person who is a student and he is leaving india for the purpose of studying abroad now what do you where you will categorize him either not this boy is not going for boy or girl i mean without any gender bias uh, he or she is living for the purpose of study so therefore she or he or she is not living for the purpose of employment nor for business or vocation and nor for even uncertain period why not uncertain period because your course duration is always certain you are going for grad or for an over post graduation or whatever management degree or whatever so you are there is a certainty over period and therefore you are not going for uncertain period and therefore there is a confusion in terms of what is the status of student now there is no clarity since uh, under the direct itself but only there is a circular which is of 2003 a quite old circular circular 45 and it says that uh, he can be regarded as a non resident now this is what you know the terminology is used. so therefore again it is not very clear it is very vaguely defined it gives a leeway to the person or the student to decide himself you know you if you wish you could be regarded as a non resident so uh, it says that by taking up studies students may have to take up job or seek scholarships to supplement their income as a result of their stay gets prolonged than what is intended while living in india so you might get some scholarship some internship and then you you initially went for 3 years but then you got an extension of 6 months or 1 year and you are also undertaking some job which usually is the case you get scholarship also therefore you will be required to have your foreign bank account you will be uh, in a position to work there and therefore it is might be entering the territory of employment so therefore they say that you know we cannot define each and every situation and therefore we are giving that you can be regarded as a non resident so it says they are not dependent for dominant part of their expenses or remittances from their household in india and therefore their intention now coming to the student again uh, it will be a choice which is available to student if you wish you can call him a non resident if you wish you can call him a resident therefore if he is not taking any internship or nothing and you want him to continue with all savings bank account in india for so far as uh, fema is concerned under the income tax based on his uh, physical stay being lower than 182 days or as per section 6 of income tax act whatever rule applies in terms of physical stay he can be regarded as a non resident under income tax but under fema he can such student can still be regarded as a resident and therefore he need not convert his ordinary savings bank account to non resident ordinary account and our account and all that things will happen so this is what the about student accounts for indian students studying abroad now there is also a reference to you know regulation 5f6 of fema notification 10r which deals with uh, notification 10 it deals with foreign currency accounts of person resident in india so you are person resident in india and you are having foreign currency account as i told you foreign currency account foreign exchange is always a property of government rbi and then bankers who only can deal in foreign exchange so if you wish to have foreign exchange lying outside there are set rules and therefore there is a separate notification which says that who are the residents and in what circumstances and in what manner they will have access to foreign exchange over outside india and that is why here it says one of the category which deals with indian student it says that indian students studying abroad may open hold and maintain foreign currency account with bank outside india during their stay outside india on return to india after completion of studies such an account will be deemed to have been opened under liberalized remittance scheme so this is what you know you can open account and uh, maintain your foreign exchange outside india as a student so therefore it says that you know you can be regarded as a resident of india you are still resident student studying outside having foreign account but you will be continuing to be regarded as a resident so far as 
now let's look at some of the interesting sections under FEMA, which which is and uh, uh, we will see the person who is living in India, emigrating Indians. So you have section six five of FEMA, which is talking about you know status of assets in India. So section six five and later we will see section six four. These are the two sections which gives kind of complete shield or complete you know these are protected from FEMA. And what is this uh, section six five? It says that. A person resident outside India may hold own transfer or invest in Indian currency security or any mobile property situated in India if such currency security or property was acquired held or owned by such person when he was resident in India or inherited from a person resident who was resident in India now basically you are looking at a situation where a person either was resident in India earlier he then left India he is now settled abroad and therefore he is we are now looking at what is the implication under FEMA with respect to assets which are held in India he might be having bank balances certain shares and immoral property and you know and all these assets can he continue to hold do I have any compliance under FEMA I have to report somewhere can I sell it and if I sell it what is the situation to so it's section 65 gives in so exemption from all these compliances or reporting or other stuff under FEMA it says that such person who is outside India may hold own transfer or invest in Indian currency security removal property situated in India if such currency security property was acquired held or owned by such person when he was resident in India or inherited from a person who was resident in India so therefore father and mother are say for example continuing in India they are continue to be resident of India the children have traveled gone abroad they will become uh, resident of foreign country and they are they can inherit they can if they are inheriting such assets security immoral property currency and other stuff they also can continue under 65 without any disclosure without any compliance now the assets that is share security which are which were acquired by time at a time when a person was resident in india can be continued to be held even after he turns out to be non-resident and the same can even be transferred investor so you therefore you can sell you can reinvest you know that is all permissible under 65 and you can even inherit now this section 65 interestingly is talking about only three categories of assets uh, it says about currency security or property so what about other assets something like you know jewelry painting there could be bullion precious stone metals you know uh, interest in partnership you know llp can you continue to own this again the same thing own transfer or invest my view is yes even though the section talks about only three categories of assets but all other assets uh, can be even uh, continue to be owned by such nri or an oci or person who has inherited india assets and the intention of therefore legislation therefore is to you know permit such nri to own all assets which he was owning prior to turning nri interest in llb so intention again of 65 is to permit nra to own all, all assets you know which he was owning nra can continue to even as a partner in indian llp even after becoming nri that is what my view is you can continue there is no need of any compliance fresh investment in llp towards capital should be made i mean should be preferably be made from non-resident ordinary account to make it distinctively clear that fresh investment is also on non-repetition basis now what do you mean by repatriation and non-repatriation when you say repatriation basis means i can take away the foreign exchange from india so otherwise all the investment which is coming from overseas you know it as i told you it will get converted to indian rupees because say for example microsoft is sending setting up a subsidiary in india now when it is setting up a it is remitting contribution towards capital to the company for example it is remitting 1 million dollar then 1 million dollar that dollar will be taken away by authorized person the indian company in exchange will receive based on prevailing exchange rate the indian rupees and therefore for example for simplicity we take rate of exchange as 75 and therefore you know 1 million will amount to seven and a half crore so seven and a half crore rupees is now coming to india foreign exchange is taken away and whatever needs to be done based on uh, situation in economy you know reserve bank will take its own course as an economist subject what do you what do you do with foreign exchange there's a problem of penalty you know at times reserve bank is puzzled now what do you do with foreign exchange because uh, of these changes which are taking place in 
global economy, this foreign exchange management has become really difficult at Reserve Bank of India. Uh, you will be surprised, you know, today the, the maybe as compared to India, the foreign exchange of China is quite, quite huge. And all these days, whenever, you know, China was the biggest investor in US Treasury bond. So whatever foreign exchange that China used to earn, and it was even an export surplus country, and therefore, whatever foreign exchange that China used to earn as a country, they used to buy U.S. Treasury bonds. And the biggest investor in the U.S. security was nothing but China. Similarly, India would also buy the U.S. Treasury paper because you cannot keep this dollar a currency. So, so therefore, as a reserve bank or as a central bank of the country, you buy foreign exchange. At times, you buy gold also. So this is something, you know, area where what you do with foreign exchange is, is a very interesting topic and, you know, Reserve Bank has to very judiciously manage this foreign exchange. Coming back to our subject, so seven and a half crore has been received in India as a rupee. Now, for example, you know, foreign exchange, Microsoft is winding up Indian company and it wants to take over this money back. So I have seven and a half crore of over a period of time, say, has become 15 crore. Now, when it becomes 15 crore, it you know liquidates a company and you know its shares are purchased or buyback or whatever way or liquidation proceeds, and you know you want to take them. So this can this rupee again be converted to dollar by going to authorized person and can I take it back? That is what is known as a repatriable investment. So if investment is a repatriable investment, the foreign investor can go to authorized person and based on the prevailing exchange rate, it will convert his rupee again into foreign exchange and take it back. So therefore, what we are seeing here when you are looking at, so therefore in the example that $1 million would have become $2 million upon at a time of repatriation, subject to payment of taxes and all that, net proceeds can be repatriated. Now, here is a case where I am saying that an, that person who was otherwise resident, he has become non-resident. He is continuing to become partner in LLP and LLP requires fresh contribution of capital and even the resident and non-resident, both the partners are likely to contribute capital the advice or the recommendation which I am giving is that since this is an old partnership firm and continuing while he was resident, therefore the investment is a non-repatriable investment. The repatriability would be only available if there is an inflow of foreign exchange. As a general rule, wherever there is an inflow of foreign exchange, there is a possibility that such investment can be regarded as a repatriable. There is a possibility, there is a choice available. The choice is only available to NRI and OCI to make investment on repatriable or non-repatriable basis. Foreign nationals or foreign company does not have usually such choice. So repatriable means you can take back your foreign exchange at the prevailing exchange rate. Now here is a case where I am saying that if LLP wants a fresh investment again from a partner who is holding such investment on non-repatriation basis, better it should come from non-resident ordinary account. You will see in the later sessions of this FEMA course, what are the different type of accounts and what are the facilities. But non-resident ordinary account is basically a non-repatriable account. And therefore, it will clearly make your intention clear that my investment is entirely coming, which is coming as a non-repatriable investment. There are facilities available for NRIs and OCIs to repatriate back these non-repatriable investment up to certain limits. But for today's discussion, for the purpose of this session, we will say that it is a non-repatriable investment. Again, fresh investment in the form of loan cannot be made to LLP. Now, under income tax, you can have capital in the form of loan or uh, normal capital or floating capital or fixed capital. But for the purpose of FEMA, and which is, uh, there's no written rule so far as this is concerned, but my view is that, you know, one should not try to give a loan to LLP and pay interest on that. The reason being that there is a very strict regime for under FEMA for any loan which is coming from non-resident. So the popular terminology which is you know governing loan transaction from non-resident is external commercial borrowing ECB. So there is a very strict regime which is to be followed for the purpose of borrowing in foreign exchange by resident Indians and therefore any form of loan uh, if it is coming from non-resident a reserve bank has to be notified and one has to follow the entire guidelines of ECB. Now, one would say that, you know, it is nothing but uh, quasi capital or it is otherwise a capital only, but since income tax it allows, you know, I have just bifurcated, you know, as a loan. But under FEMA, loan is a very, very term which is, you know, very, very strictly observed. And why so? The discussion point, what I said, you know, the problem of plenty with the reserve bank, that foreign exchange reserve is that it, maybe India is also sitting on a very comfortable foreign exchange reserve. But what is the composition of this foreign exchange reserve? 
is it out of uh, portfolio investment by foreign portfolio investment or investor or is it by your foreign direct investment you know like for example uh, uh, any foreign uh, non resident company or foreign company investing in india on the basis of uh, foreign direct investment for example uh, honda motors setting up a plant in india for scooter manufacturing bike manufacturing and they bring capital to india that is foreign direct investment or the yeah, carlyle capital you know buying some shares on a stock exchange in india that is a portfolio investment and third composition is a debt for example you know uh, reliance raising external commercial borrowing okay and therefore there is a debt now out of this foreign exchange reserves which we are talking if there is a huge portion of foreign exchange reserves which reserve bank is holding and it is in the form of a debt raised by indian resident it is under a threat then as a policy you know generally one would like as any central bank for that matter not just reserve bank of india but any central bank to manage foreign exchange they would want that you know especially developing economies like india which is uh, short on uh, uh, current account as a deficit we are a current account deficit country so therefore wherever there is a shortage of foreign exchange on current account we would be very very cautious to say that my what is my debt composition within the entire basket of foreign exchange and therefore i would not like my foreign exchange reserves to be skewed in favor of debt if the ratio of foreign exchange reserves is more than 50% which is in the form of debt and which is payable next year or six months one year two year three years then you know i am in a scary position today exchange rate may be 75 but if it goes to 80 or 90 you know it will be very difficult for such country and such central bank to manage foreign exchange and therefore there have been many cases where the economies of the countries have gone for a toss you look at pakistan these days you know exchange rate has gone from 90 100 pakistan rupee to now 115 20 or i don't know what maybe it is 180 or so so inflation the current account deficit and all this management has a issue and therefore loan from any form of loan coming from foreigners or non resident you know one will have to completely follow the rules of external commercial borrowing and therefore i am saying that bring it by way of equity existing loan can be continued here yeah. uh we can skip this uh, slide you know i mean it is more akin to what i have discussed in the pre preceding slides and then interest in indian partnership yeah you can even continue to be uh, continue to be partner in norm normal partnership firm uh that is not a issue fresh investment again should be made from nro don't give loan that's what my uh, advice is and uh, you can have the the slide which i have kept here and which i put here is that you know under indian partnership act uh, it permits firm at least in maharashtra partnership you know having all the nris and ocis as partner no need of having resident partner so if you are looking we had a case where you know there were uh, family coming from singapore and they wanted to establish a business entity in india and they had no contacts in india and they never trusted anyone to be a local director or you know local partner as you know even indian companies act now requires that there has to be one local director who is resident of india even llp wants one of the partner to be a designated partner who should be resident india but under indian at least indian partnership act and under maharashtra you know we have seen that you know you can have all the partners who could be nra and oca so in such circumstances where probably you want entire business to be only owned by uh, nra or oca there is a possibility of you know firm and you can have the firm with having all the partners who are either nra or oca mind well you cannot have foreign nationals as a partner because this is only available on non repetition basis and this could be only available to nri and oci again i am reiterating that if you are looking at a person resident outside india remember we have divided into four categories nri oci foreign national and non individuals who are foreign companies or foreign llps or foreign corporate bodies whatever you call it impact on transactions done at a time when person was resident in india you can you know continue to whatever your bank accounts are there i think you will have to redesignate as nr so we are looking at emigrating indian person who has left india uh, will have to redesignate his account to nro account you know balance in efc and rfc domestic account can be created to nrfc in b account even demat account if 65 permits nri to continue to own securities which were acquired while person was resident of india securities in demat account can be continued to be held by nri and nri needs to intimate the depository about change in residence status schedule 3 and 4 of non rent instrument rules permits nri to make portfolio on repatriation and not repatriation basis you can make investment on a portfolio for both the category repatriation and non repatriation then the investment in securities 
uh, existing on the date of becoming NRI will be characterized as non-repeatable investment. Uh, you can continue with the LICs and policies which were taken in India and no permission is required for payment of premium. PPF account you can continue with for uh, PPF account till the time of 15 or 5, 15 years. Uh, but after maturity that account cannot be renewed and foreign currency investment made outside India under liberalized remittance scheme and ODA all foreign currency investment made under LRS can be continued. So you were resident of India. You had made investment overseas under liberalized remittance scheme of 250,000 dollars. Those can be continued and in case of overseas direct investment transition. So you I think uh, I'll, I think I'll skip this point but otherwise when, whenever there is a uh, session on ODA you will come across this point. Uh, just to summarize and very briefly touch that you know I made a business investment. I was a resident Indian. I made a business investment. I set up a company in Singapore uh, for my business and therefore I was director and maybe I was the shareholder major shareholder more than 15 percent under two lakh fifty thousand dollar scheme and now I'm becoming non-resident. So my becoming a non-resident I'm supposed to intimate with the bank that you know now I've become non-resident and therefore for India as a country it is no more a overseas direct investment of India. Mind you, Reserve Bank of India keeps track of every foreign exchange movement happening from India. Every foreign exchange movement happening from India is tracked by Reserve Bank. For what purpose it is going, for what purpose it is coming to India. And therefore, when I go out and become non resident, I intimate Reserve Bank. And Reserve Bank will say that, oh, now it is not an overseas direct investment so far as balance sheet of foreign exchange, with which Reserve Bank India is maintaining. Impact of transition, we continue with one person resident in India, investment in immobile property, property, property bought jointly by father and son in 2018 under liberalized remittance scheme. Son intends to go for studies abroad in 2020 and son intends to go for employment in 2020. Implications of gift of property. Uh, I think we can, for the timing, liberalized remittance scheme as well as the property session is uh, that going to be taken. So I'll skip this. I'll be otherwise encroaching upon that topic. But it is just to give you idea that, you know, you can continue to have this transition, but gift of property overseas, whenever you're looking at gift of property by resident to non-resident, which we'll see in current account, I mean, current and capital account transition, we'll again touch upon this point. For the timing, I'm just skipping this point. Gift of overseas property NRI OCI to resident. The gift of immobile property situated outside India from NRI or OCI to resident is under approval. Now, this is usually this way transition we are looking at inbound gift. Uh, there is an NRI or OCI and he or she wishes to gift some immobile property which is again situated outside India to a resident Indian and this transition requires approval of Reserve Bank of India. So we had a case where there was a uh, daughter which she left India in early 2000. Uh, she married to UK national and became a UK citizen also and in 2019 uh, 2018 uh, she was the only child and she thought that you know I want to gift uh, my old house in London to my parents and she gifted that flat to her father while father and mother were there visiting the daughter so you know they she gave a gift they entered into all proper documentation as per UK law and they registered the transition and document and later on upon day when you know they consulted they discussed it the looking at the FEMA notification 7R which deals with acquisition of property outside India it transpired that you know your such gift is under approval and therefore, uh, you know, we had to go the transition to Reserve Bank to say that transition has already taken place. The father who is resident is owner of such property, residential property in London. And therefore, you know, we went and this transition was compounded. Uh, the difficulty with this transition is that, you know, Reserve Bank wants the date of gift, the value of the property as on the date of gift and value of the property even as on the date of compounding or filing an application for compounding and if there is an appreciation in the property you know the it will be treated as a deemed gain and it can be entire gain can be compounded by way of compounding fee so in addition to normal compounding fee if there is an appreciation and now this appreciation is to be considered in rupee terms not in foreign currency terms so luckily in this case you know the property was acquired and thereafter the brexit took place and because of Brexit, the property in London didn't move. In fact, it depreciated a bit by a few percentage. And therefore, this transition never had any, inter I mean, uh, the capital gain, so-called unrealized capital gain in terms of valuation. And therefore, there was no 
taking away of com the unrealized gain but otherwise in addition to the compounding fee there is possibility that you know entire capital gain could be taken away. so be watchful of such transition of you know uh, receipt of immoral property by way of gift of course these are very rare transition but one has to be aware the advantage of becoming nri and oci is that you know uh, the income earned abroad need not be repatriated to india so this is the biggest thing you know you become a non-resident indian and therefore whatever earnings that you are making in overseas you know you need not repatriate back to india of course under liberalized remittance scheme uh, if i'm buying a property as an individual and if i'm renting it out which is permissible i need not repatriate rent, rent back to india that is what is the permission given otherwise as i told you whatever foreign exchange in terms of section 8 accrues and dues it is the obligation of resident indian to bring it back subject to rules of relaxation available otherwise he can take away investment from india up to 1 million dollars so instead resident indians are given facility of 2 lakh 50 thousand dollars nri and oci can repatriate from india 1 million dollar and they can have nri nro account uh, caution points of becoming nri i think i'll skip this point you can later on read and just you know absorb on your own I think it will be fairly easy for you now. Now, returning Indians, we saw the emigrating Indians. Now we look at uh, returning Indians, and that is section 6.4. So, we in detail considered section 6.5. As I told you, it shields or it protects from application of FEMA. Section 6.4 is other way around as persons resident in India. So, I was otherwise non resident for all these years. I have now come back to India for settling in India. And it says that you know, person resident in India may hold, own, transfer, or invest in foreign currency, foreign security, or any human property situated house in India. If such currency, security, or property was acquired, held, or owned by such person when he was resident outside India, or inherited from a person who was resident outside India. Again, same replica of uh, Section 6.5. Only for other way around that I am now resident and I have upon return to India, I'll continue to own all these assets. Now, again, only three class of assets currency, security, and immobile property. But again, as I told you, my view is that you know everything such as painting or you know other precious stone or whatever that you have earned overseas in my view you can continue to keep it outside india now there is a section 64 of emma which says that it covers foreign transition so foreign currency accounts income earned through employment or business or vocation outside india or foreign exchange including any income so these are the you know things which you can there's a circular which says that you can continue to earn all these all these assets but in my view certain precious stones or paintings or jewelries or something generally you will bring back to india but otherwise there are certain things you may be having like cars and all that in my view one did not you know uh, bring it back to india you can continue to own these assets yeah uh, whether assets other assets like jewelry painting silver articles or others can be continued to be owned in terms of six four this as i you know told you my intention intention seems to be two percent to own outside india as a precaution if somebody wants you can list out your assets and just intimate to your authorized dealer which in turn can intimate to the bank of india uh, now the interesting issue would be you know what happens to my cryptocurrency you know does it do you mean that still there's a taboo that is the bank of india doesn't want indian resident to own cryptocurrency of course these days uh, we have seen that a lot of uh, exchanges a lot of companies have come out with uh, offering you know that they will permit resident indians to trade in cryptocurrency uh, of course Reserve bank always had the reservation on dealing in cryptocurrency and it never uh, permitted but they lost the case in supreme court and say that you know you cannot prohibit such cryptocurrency uh, investment or trading other stuff uh, therefore as on it it looks like that even if i'm holding cryptocurrency as a non-resident which i have created overseas i need not you know uh, there won't be any negative implication of continuing to own such cryptocurrency impact on transition done at a time when a person was resident outside india now this is talking about uh, round tripping search of, uh, structure one of many of you would have heard this term round tripping and therefore you say that you know an individual was having a company outside india while he was being a non-resident so he is let's say for example there's a person who was a software engineer he left india he's an iit and he set up a company there and uh, you know uh, uh, he set up a company there and how he's come back to india he continues to be the shareholder of the company he has resigned from all directorship and other active role in the company and now we are continuing to own the shares now at the time can you continue to own such shares in the indian company after becoming resident no doubt section 64 permits that at the time such overseas company had made investment fdi in india so while he was non-resident the indian company which is was in, sorry us company which was there had a subsidiary in india 
Now, therefore, at that point of time, it was a foreign direct investment. Okay. And now these shares were of the foreign company were owned by a person who was otherwise non-resident. Now it's coming back to India. Now, can you continue to be the structure which is ODI and FDI structure? What is round tripping is that money going from India to a foreign country for investment and either same money or along with additional borrowing you are bringing back such money back to India that is round tripping. So capital going from India and coming back to it back to India in the form of FDI. So it is ODI and FDI structure. So ODI or FDI structure is otherwise not allowed. But in this case after becoming a resident of India even though ODI and FDI structure can continue that is what my opinion is. Uh, whether overseas company can make fresh FDI in India, will it amount to round tripping? Uh, if it is using its own resources, I think this is a gray area. And uh, uh, because you have become a resident, and therefore going to making fresh investments from foreign country to country other than India is absolutely no issue. But coming back to India, I mean that even fresh investment which such company now wanting to make in India, it will require, in my view, RBI approval. Impact of transition for bank accounts. So you can continue to have your bank account overseas. NRE account should be redesignated to resident account upon return to India. We already seen that, you know, an NRE account to be redesignated as a resident rupee account. Funds in NRE account can even be transferred to RFC account at the option of account holder. So if you wish, you know, that you want to retain your foreign currency even after return to India and NRE or FCNR account, you can convert to RFC account. Uh, FCNR account deposits can be continued till maturity on maturity the same shall be converted to rupee deposit or to RFC account. Insurance policy that is overseas insurance policies uh, can be continued no permission required for payment of premium. Uh, maturity proceeds or amounts of or any claim due shall be repatriated to India within seven days of the receipt. So this is where you know uh, even the maturity proceeds of the LIC policies which has taken overseas uh, you have to repatriate back to India. Uh, the advantages of RFC account, you know, you can have RFC account, no restriction on utilization of funds in outside India, including restriction in Schedule 3 to account. So RFC account is after becoming a resident, if I want to remit overseas money uh, for whatever purpose, then I am restricted by liberalized remittance scheme, which is $250,000. But if I have money which is lying in RFC account, that is not applicable, the $250,000 scheme, and I can use it for transition. Of course, this is per pre limit is available only for Schedule 3 related transition, but not for Schedule 1 and T. One and two, which is kind of purchase of overseas lottery or gambling or betting, you cannot use RFC account money for that purposes. But otherwise, for Schedule Three current account transaction, you can use this. Uh, permissible credits here, you know, you can credit pension if you are running for a pension or superannuation, you can credit to this account. Uh, whatever assets are realized on conversion of assets referred to in six four, you can credit to India. So six four assets, if they are sold and you don't want to hold in the foreign country, you can, you know credit foreign currency to RFC account whatever gifts or inheritance you are receiving that also you can credit so this is what you know you can bring it to India and then maintain in RFC account even LIC or insurance policy and all that can be written only difference when you are saying that you know RFC account is maintained by authorized person in India and therefore there is a control of uh, you know regulator reserve bank you know the what is the foreign exchange available so that is what they know of course it is lying in foreign currency but territory under Indian territory. Now we look at another important aspect and that is what the crux of FEMA you can say having studied definitions or the residential status and the philosophy of Reserve Bank you know foreign exchange. Now let's look at the capital and current account transition. So the concept of capital and current account transition was not there in FEMA. Uh, the drawal of foreign exchange was regulated without differentiating between capital or current account and it was even absent after introduction of new industrial policy and first time it was introduced in 1999 under FEMA and it replaced uh, FERA and it's an economic concept and not an accounting concept. So the FERA had a very different regime you know that every foreign exchange requirement required approval of Reserve Bank of so before 1999 when there was no difference of capital and current account transaction if you wish to draw foreign exchange for any purpose one has to specifically write to rbi that this is what my purpose of uh, i want to go abroad for film shoot or for buying computers or travel or medicine or medical treatment or whatever you know you write to rbi RBI will examine the application and depending upon its foundation position, it may grant you full quota what you have asked for or it may not grant. 
So every transaction, basically every draw, not transaction, but every draw of foreign exchange required RBI approval. And therefore, there was no chance of any error. There was no chance of any contravention. If you are legally trying to use foreign exchange and legally trying to draw foreign exchange because it was under the sanction of Reserve Bank of India always. And therefore, there is no concept of compounding also. The transition of, uh, you know, contravention would not arise. Situation of contravention will never arise because every transition is scrutinized by Reserve Bank of India. Come FEMA and you divided the transition of under foreign of foreign exchange under capital account and current account and current account transitions were given free regime and therefore you started drawing foreign exchange you know, without going to RBI and therefore there is a possibility of you know error taking place either at you know your own level in terms of interpretation or you gave a wrong declaration to banker or authorized person and therefore there's a possibility of contravention and therefore you have the provisions of compounding and penalty which is now becoming rampant under FEMA. Look at the uh, now the FEMA structure dealing with capital account transition. So section six one of capital account transitions is sex, sorry section six one of FEMA says that subject to the provisions of subsection to any person may sell or draw foreign exchange to or from an authorized person for a capital account transition. So subject to provisions of subsection two. So capital account transition is a very strict regime, and you know subject to so and so and you may have to go to authorized person and then try to say buy or sell foreign exchange. so if i go to reserve bank of i mean if i go to any authorized person you know and i want to buy foreign exchange you know i'll be asked to submit a form along with form you know they will ask me what is the purpose of the transition so you'll have to choose one of the purpose and that is a uh, format given with all the codes you know whether you want to invest overseas whether it is repatriation of dividend of foreign investment whether you want to go for travel you want to go for education and a lot of categories are given and one will have to select one of the code and therefore that's where the time where you know transition gets divided into capital of current account and we'll see the definition of capital and current account yeah yeah so only point which i want to draw here is in the last point that you know section 3a of fema and which says that dealing in or transferring of any foreign exchange to any person other than the authorized person is a contravention of FEMA. And section three, contravention of section 3A is not compoundable. Once you see the contravention is not compoundable, what do you mean by compounding? Compounding is a very soft process. It's a very process whereby, you know, penalty of three times is not levied. It is simply that there is a ready matrix given and the compounding rules, which says that, you know, for so-and-so technical contravention, this is the amount of penalty you will pay. Uh, it is not penalty but compounding fee you will pay and you uh, the transition then gets regularized i mean it gets a kind of uh, that contravention was there you regularize the contravention whatever uh, wrong dealings whether either you rectify it or you unwind the transition and therefore go for compounding but 3a talks about dealing or transferring foreign exchange as i told you foreign exchange is the property of central government rbi and authorized person so if I deal in foreign exchange, what do you mean by dealing in foreign exchange? Dealing in foreign exchange means buying or selling of foreign exchange. For example, I leave India for the purpose of travel, a leisure travel or pleasure travel, and I ask for a foreign exchange currency of you know, $5,000, and I, other than my credit card, which I have loaded with $10,000, I also took a currency foreign exchange of $5,000. I come back from my pleasure trip, and you know I am, I am holding that $3,000 you know, in hard currency, and one of my friends, after 15 days of my arrival to India, he wants to travel overseas. And then he says that, you know, you've got leftover foreign exchange. Give it to me $3,000. I'll pay you rupee or I'll give you a check. Now that amounts to dealing. So even though my draw of foreign exchange was legal, I went to bank and I draw it. I bought foreign exchange at prevailing exchange rate. The later dealing. So me and my friend both have dealt in foreign exchange without involvement of authorized person. What was my obligation? My obligation was to surrender $3,000 and ask for Indian rupee, credit to my account. And his obligation was to again go to authorized dealer and ask for required foreign currency. I couldn't deal, that is, I cannot buy and sell foreign exchange without involvement of foreign currency. So if there is a contravention of 3A, that means dealing in foreign exchange, it will be directly an enforcement directorate matter. Now let's look at the definition of capital account. Capital account transaction means a transaction which alters assets or liabilities, including contingent liabilities outside India of person resident in India. 
let's read it again which alters assets or liabilities including contingent liabilities outside india of person resident in india so if you're, there's a person resident in india any transition any transition which has the impact of altering assets or liabilities overseas including contingent liability for a person resident in india it will amount to capital account transaction and other way around assets or liabilities in india of person resident outside india and include transaction which are referred to in section 60 so any transaction which is resulting into creation of assets or liabilities overseas for resident indian and any transaction which results into creation of assets or liabilities in india for person resident outside india it will be regarded as a capital account transaction Section 6.3 of MI is listing down all the category of capital account transaction which is possible and these are the only exhaustive list so to say. It is transfer or issue of any security by person resident in India. This means that you know all foreign direct investment or foreign portfolio investment will get covered here. Transfer or issue of any security by person resident uh, outside India. This is talking about issue of foreign security by person resident outside India and first one is person resident in India. So there is inbound investment and outbound investment. Then transfer or issue of foreign security or foreign security by any branch office or agency in India to a person resident outside India. This is something like you know uh, IPO of foreign current foreign company or you know something like that which can be subscribed by India. Any borrowing or lending. What we talked about external commercial borrowing in foreign exchange. This is capital account transaction. Borrowing or lending in Indian rupees. The deposits between Indian resident in India and resident outside in India. Uh, export import and holding of currency or currency notes transfer of immobile property acquisition of immobile property in india so these are the type of transaction which will be regarded as a capital account transaction because this will result into creation of assets overseas or liabilities overseas or for non resident other way around. then even a giving of a guarantee or surety in respect of any debt or obligation will also be regarded as a capital account transaction because as we know that you know even creation of a contingent liability is also a capital account transition so because it says that person resident in india i'm sorry capital account transition means a transition which alters assets or liabilities including contingent liabilities so if there is any transaction which is resulting into a creation of contingent liability outside india by a resident it will be regarded as a capital account transition that is giving of a guarantee so if you know uh, as an indian company is standing as a guarantor for the debt which is raised by uh, its subsidiary overseas you know it will be or even the director giving a guarantee or whoever gives a guarantee so you are creating a contingent liability that way in foreign exchange in favor of non-resident and therefore it is a sir sorry uh, to inter sir sir this is vikas jain okay. regional council member sir we'll have to uh, conclude within next five seven minutes as the we are running short of time actually five seven minutes okay yes sir. i was yes, told sir. you five thirty i was told yes, okay sir. fine fine so what i'll do Give me 10 minutes, I'll try to complete within 10 minutes. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, uh, this is what you know, even contingent liability will get covered, and therefore, this is a capital account transaction. What we will do is we will look at some of the examples, you know, which will give a clear idea about you know what is the uh, yeah, and these are the notifications, you know, the notifications which dealt with uh, uh, capital account transaction, as I told you in the beginning that you know. Uh, every notification is there for a capital account transaction, which is a self-contained code, which has its own definition, and therefore this is a list of capital account transaction. Of course, now the powers to deal with capital account transaction for equity or non-debt is only with central government, unlike uh, prior regime. But these are the list of notifications which will deal with uh, capital account transaction. Uh, contingent liability we have already seen uh, and therefore for the time being I'll skip this uh, few slides uh, the slides are given in quite detail and therefore it says that you know while resident creating a guarantee in favor of non-resident it is always a contingent liability but contingent uh, liability by non-resident to resident is not covered. therefore if non-resident is acting as a guarantor okay the non-resident is also creating a contingent liability but now he is creating in india and but this transaction is outside the purview of course the there is a reference to the circular but at times if you wish to raise a debt say for example there is a subsidiary in india that subsidiary in india is in need of funds now there are two options to raise funds by subsidiary either you increase the capital that means parent will have to remit additional capital or you raise the external commercial borrowing as i told you you know external commercial borrowing is a very strict regime you will have to follow a lot of uh, compliances and one has to fit in the policy so what is the other way possible other way possible is that non-resident uh, 
or parent company will act as a guarantor it will stand as a guarantor and based on back to back guarantee the indian bank in india will lend money to subsidiary in india now the last leg of transaction that is indian bank giving the lending to an indian uh, lending money to an indian company is outside the purview of fma because it is a rupee transaction only thing if guarantee is invoked so that means indian subsidiary is unable to make payment to indian bank then guarantee will be invoked and non resident or parent company will fulfill its obligation and therefore it will remit money to india in the form of repayment of bank loan upon repayment of bank loan in the indian subsidiary's book which was otherwise a bank liability now it will stand as a liability payable to foreign parent and that is a permissible transaction under fma that is what the limited point i wanted to try now let's look at some of the transaction of uh, capital account transaction or current account nature of transaction and whether what is the transaction impact so gift of sum of money by resident to non resident or non resident to resident is a current account transaction now let's try to apply this definition so you are a father in india is remitting money to a son who is there as a non resident and is remitting money now for a father his assets so called assets one would say that you know his bank balances has gone down and therefore there is a difference in assets now it is reduced his assets and therefore it should be regarded as a capital account transaction but if you closely examine the definition it says that for a person resident in india there should be change in overseas assets or liabilities so my assets have gone down but in india not in foreign country therefore this gift of sum of money is a current account transaction okay if it is a gift of foreign security definitely it's a capital account transaction and what are the ways and means in which security this capital account transaction gift can be done this is given who is the donor and who is the donee so if non resident is a donor and resident is a donee this is a permissible transaction so foreign security is gifted by foreigner to a resident it is permissible resident to resident i am holding a shares of you know foreign company and i want to gift a shares to foreign company to a my relative then it is requiring rbi approval because it is not coming under general approval general permission resident to non resident again not covered so this way you know i have tried to give you the flavor of what are the transaction and whether it will what are the it is permissible even though it is a capital account transaction whether it is permissible under general route or if it is not permissible one will have to approach reserve bank of india for approval settling of property in a trust you know there is a trust in india where there are going to be nri as beneficiary so family office you know wanting to settle a trust where some of the beneficiaries are resident indians some of the beneficiaries are going to be non resident indians and what is the situation it is definitely a capital account transaction because for non resident uh, they will be becoming beneficiary and they will be owning certain assets now i mean discretionary trust non discretionary trust specific trust and all this as issues will also have some implication under fema but by and large you know fema recognizes that you can give sum of money as a uh, up to liberalized remittance scheme as a resident but any property security or other assets will have its specific regime for settling property in trust and one will it is always better that we approach this the bank for prior approval now change in the nature of transaction due to passage of time so originally the transaction was current account transaction for example import of goods or import of services now import of goods says that you know you will make payment within 6 months that whatever goods have been imported there is a time limit for 6 months now there have been cases where you know you trade payables are extended because of liquidity crunch or other reasons and they continue for a period of more than 3 years there have been cases where reserve bank has considered this long outstanding of 3 years and more as a deemed external commercial borrowing or deemed borrowing and there are a couple of you know uh, case, compounding orders on there and this is the list of this compounding order then raising uh, funding on the basis of export invoice that is which is known as a overseas or foreign factoring or foreign exchange factoring you know i export the goods and instead of you know i i discount my export invoice so my the payment of export invoice is done by financing company overseas and that is known as factoring now factoring is a permissible transaction that is what i wanted limited point to drive and even though there could be some payment of interest it is still outside the purview of uh, ecb because here is a case of not specific borrowing but i am just converting my export re receivables into a factoring and realizing my export quite in advance current account transaction is transaction other than a capital account transaction and it says payment due in connection with foreign trade or short term banking facility and this is the kind of uh, transaction which are given current account transactions are governed by current account rules 
so instead of capital account where there is a notification for every capital account transaction for current account there is only one piece of legislation which is current account rules and india has agreed under world trade organization agreement which is on general agreement on trade and tariff to say that we are opening indian economy on current account transaction that means that you know if resident indians wanting to draw foreign exchange or receive foreign exchange if it is on current account we will give a general approval therefore under pema the thumb rule is that you know current account transactions are usually permissible generally permissible unless prohibited whereas capital account transactions are generally prohibited unless permitted so that is how we we'll have to divide current and capital account and there are three schedules to current and capital account and this is what the list of schedule 1 2 and 3 is given and you will have more details in the next few lectures of this series also where we will dealing with lrs and other stuff yeah uh, i'll just keep this few slides now just this one point you know current account transactions which is unincorporated joint ventures now for example that otherwise investment in india coming from non-resident will in the form of subsidiary or joint venture or you know becoming partner in llp all these are the examples of capital account transition because non-resident is creating assets in india but there could be a certain collaboration you know certain joint ventures which is beyond financial involvement and this could be you know the list which i have given you know cooperation agreement strategic alliances it could be technology transfer agreement it could be joint product development it could be purchasing agreement distributing agreement marketing and promotion collaboration where there are two joint foreigners non-resident a foreign company and indian company are coming into some sort of arrangement but without involvement of partnership or without involvement of you know capital involvement in the form of company or joint venture or llp it is merely this kind of arrangement which will be regarded as a current account transaction there's some reference to unincorporated joint ventures which is available under FEMA, which i have given under regulation 7 of PIR. Uh, this slides talk about you know payment of royalties and lump sum fees up to 2009 there were restrictions on remittance of royalties and fees for technical services which was five percent and eight percent uh royalties payable to non-resident for use of trademark or brand or otherwise you know it was five percent for local sale and eight percent on export sales now there are no such limits this is just to give you an idea that you know how we have moved based on the development of foreign exchange and the buoyancy in the foreign exchange you know we have come out with such kind of restrictions which are otherwise there under uh, a decade ago uh, advance against export of goods you can even receive advance against export of goods and uh, this is with current account transaction uh, only thing to be borne in mind is that advance can be received only if it is export of goods and not export of services uh, so if it is export of goods you got an order and a firm order and you want to export you can receive advance you can even pay interest on such advance it will still be regarded as a current account transaction conversion of current account to capital account you can convert you know current account transaction to capital account for example you allot shares against import of goods against uh, pre incorporation expenses that is possible subject to certain compliances that is what is doable change in the nature of capital account transaction from debt to equity so external commercial borrowing can be converted to equity so that is what is possible and i think that's what is uh, bringing my presentation to an end and it was really a pleasure talking to you everyone here to deal with this subject on pema and uh, if there's time permissible and if there are any questions it would be my pleasure to do so. thank you so much thank you uh, thank you manoj Jain for this wonderful session and very elaborately uh, taken up all the provisions of pema uh, now uh, I think we don't have much time. So if there are any questions, we will, uh, you know, ask uh, the participants to just mail us all those questions and then we can put up to you and maybe we can get an answer to those questions because we have uh, run out of time. Now, uh, oh. may I request my regional council colleague, uh, Vikas Jain, to uh, propose a very well-deserved uh, hearty vote of thanks to the faculty here, Manu, Manu Shah, please. Thank you, Dr. Ben. Uh, it has been a wonderful session, very elaborated, and I think actually more time was required looking to the preparation that Manos sir had. Uh, it, uh, I think we need to have one more session on such kind of topic in the times to come, and sir, definitely would love to have you again. And thank you once again on behalf of the members present who, who have been attending this program, and on behalf of WRC for being with us. Thank you for sparing your valuable time. Thank you, sir.
Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Uh, moving on, thank you, Vikas Bhai. Thank you very much for this uh, vote of thanks. May I now move on to the next session? And we have our very eminent faculty here. We have our very eminent faculty here. We have uh, CA Paresha, and he's going to talk to us about FDI. Uh, may I request uh, Vikas Bhai to please introduce the faculty? Uh, Mr. Bin, I think uh, Bhavesh, somebody else would be introducing. Can you introduce the faculty, Yes, yes. Uh, just a second. Mr. Steven. Yeah. So uh, it is again a great pleasure for me uh, to introduce our learned senior faculty, Paresh Bhai Shah. Paresh Bhai is a science graduate in chemistry in 1981 and is a member of the institute for almost 35 years now. He is having specialization in FEMA and taxation with a special focus on cross-border transactions and its taxation, inbound and outbound business taxations and regulatory aspects, foreign collaborations and joint ventures, legal and tax aspects. He has successfully launched a unique international tax journal for the Chamber of Tax Consultants Mumbai and designated as the first editor of the prestigious journal, a path-breaking initiative during the June year, month June 2017, first time in India. Uh, he has authored various books and publications on FEMA taxation and uh, apart from that he is a regular speaker on various platforms and forums his uh, resume runs in pages i would say his profile runs in pages but uh, we would love to hear him more so with this brief introduction i present before you are today's learned faculty parish Vaisha. thank you May I? Yes, please, please, sir. Am I audible? Very well. Sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Chairman uh, of the WRC, Shri Manish Gadia, Vice Chairperson, uh, Mr. Dusty Desai, the organizers of this uh, conference, coordinators, Bhavesh Shah and Vikas Chain. My dear friends, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, um, you already heard the first session and uh, I'm going to take up the second session. So first of all, uh, I'm thankful to WRC having given me this opportunity to present my thoughts on FDI and particularly I'm told to share my thoughts on schedule one, four and Six. Now, you already heard the overview of the FEMA law transactions, current account transactions, capital account transactions, remittance facilities, schedule one, two, and three of the current account transactions, and various details on the capital account transactions and what is the capital account transaction? The general law that all current account transactions are available to the Forex users in India, except those three schedules, which are referred by my friend Manoj Shah, there, there is some restriction. Whereas all the capital account transactions are not free. They are free only to the extent what is stated in that particular capital account transaction as permissible transaction. What is not stated in the regulations of a particular capital account transaction cannot be done. So in the a capital account transaction, 
relating to the foreign direct investment in India. A similar is the law that any issue of capital is a capital count transaction. Any transfer of shares is also a capital transaction, therefore, because it's nothing but the moving of capital from one person to another person. So, therefore, in dealing with this regulation, the similar law will apply that what is stated in the law will only be permitted, what is not stated will not be permitted. So what is this transaction is and why it is a capital count transaction? It is very simple that a company will issue the shares or there can be a transfer of shares. Both the transactions are capital count transaction because there is a change in the assets in India of the non-resident. When the shares are issued, asset is created in the favor of non-resident and where I, when the shares are transferred probably transferee who is a non-resident will also have a new asset in India and therefore there is an alteration of assets in India in terms of share capital or any other instrument which is called capital instrument is a capital account transaction. These capital account transactions of uh, foreign direct investments are covered in NDR regulations, non-debt regulations of 2019 pronounced by the Government of India, the of Industry and Commerce, Department of Economic Affairs. Prior to issue of uh, these regulations, it was a prerogative of... Uh... Hello? It was a. It was a PPT. Okay, yes, it is there. I think no, here only. Um... Uh, it should be here, no. Cannot see it. Go to webinar. Okay. So, Mishra ji, if you can share your uh, presentation, if you have a present, you can present it. Sir, you can say it. Uh, one second. Uh, no, there is, uh, I can't see that. Okay, one second. Uh, what is this screen? Thank you. Oh, in short. I cannot see my, I could see earlier, but not now. Sir, can you do Alt tab? Alt F? Alt tab. Okay. Okay. See, Mishra ji, we can see his screen. I think he's gone on to this go to webinar, uh, which is on Twitter. So,
सर आप कंपनी चालू करने देते थे देखा रहा सर जी आई हैव आई हैव तो अच्छा ग्लो ग्लो वर्क सर इफ यू जस्ट लुक एट द रिबेट टाउन गो टू अभिनय आगे no 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 you have it's already open so if you just go yeah. to the ribbon down there's that yellow flower kind of a thing on the right side before uh -huh. your recycle bin there are two documents and uh, there's a just go down the ribbon down at the bottom at the bottom of the screen okay if you see the yellow thing the yellow round circle with a kind of you know flower kind of a thing yeah just click on uh, no there is some problem uh, we can see your screen sir so if yeah. you go to the bottom, bottom there is a ribbon uh, yeah. so if you uh, see that yellow thing just just click on the oh. yellow thing there you are already yeah. uh, actually yeah see can you because uh, this is this sharing i think Link, yeah and right? now you have your powerpoint also sir your powerpoint also i can see down so i think your your presentation must be open there this is ppt no no this is not ppt sir oh no. i can uh, earlier i could see my powerpoint here i cannot see my powerpoint okay. can, I, can i take my laptop also here right and now we cannot see your screen earlier we could see your screen mishra ji aapke paas agar presentation hai हाँ उनके पास है मेरा हाँ ये सर का वीडियो बंद हो गया है टू टेक माय प्रेजेंटेशन नो बिकॉज देन ओनली आई कैन मूव इट सर आपका स्क्रीन शेयरिंग मैं यहाँ पे कर रहा हूँ इट इज नॉट कन्वीनियंट टू मी नो वेरी इनकनवीनियंट Oh, uh, I can. Can I go to my desktop from here or not? Yeah, you can share your screen, I guess. Yeah, I can take my. This was what was told me. Told to me that share my web webcam, keyboard and mouse. Sir, आप कंट्रोल मुझे दे दिए सर. हाँ, okay, दे दिया आपको. हाँ, अभी आपका स्क्रीन शेयर करिए सर. मेरा स्क्रीन यहाँ से ले हो सकता है हाँ सर एप्लीकेशन एरर हाँ सर स्क्रीन आ गया सर आपका हेलो ये शायद स्पीकर का
FDA, FDA is to be taken. Sarma ji. Nijira ji. Ye second jo handout mein, second jo hai na FDI. I think that is the one. So friends, we are facing some technical issue. Uh, we'll see, uh, soon resolve it. So please hold on. And uh, once we resolve it, we'll be able to start the session. Thanks for your patience.
Great. Hmm. Abhi? Yes, we can see your presentation, sir. Now. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. But I can't see you now. Okay. Done. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry, my all of you for this uh, confusion, but perfect now. So uh, we were at uh, the, I can't see again. So am I audible? Yes, very well. Okay. Hello. But I cannot see any of you, huh? Uh -huh. Actually, we even can't see you. That's what I'm saying. So how to do that? So when you are in presentation mode, what I understand is you will not be able to see yourself, but we can see you if your camera is on. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, so uh, we said that it is a capital account transaction. There are uh, this particular capital account transaction is uh, divided into two parts while framing the regulation. Now, one is uh, it is an FDI transaction, foreign direct investment, and the second transaction is a portfolio investment type transactions. And when we deal with the foreign direct investment transaction, it is pertaining to schedule one schedule four and schedule six what are this transaction typically it is an investment by a non-resident in the foreign company framed as schedule one it is the transaction of a investment by non-resident in a partnership firm or llp on a non-repatriation basis a is framed as schedule four and the last transaction or which is an investment by non-resident in the capital of the llp framed as schedule six and rest of the schedule uh, like two three five seven eight nine and ten are generally in the nature of uh, portfolio investments now what is a portfolio investment we generally understand what is the foreign direct investment difference between the two if you see the regulations the difference is very simple they say that if the investment is less than 10 percent in the capital of the indian company which is a unlisted company or a listed company generally uh, any investment in the unlisted company is treated as a foreign direct investment because there is no portfolio investment in the unlisted company but if a less than 10 percent is invested in the listed company then it is treated as a portfolio investment and it remains the portfolio investment throughout the life of the investment also if an investment is more than 10 percent and it is treated as an fdi and even if such an investment goes below 10 percent because of various uh, restructuring action or a dilution or etc it still remains an fdi transaction only it doesn't become portfolio automatically because of the dilution now there are two more concept that this investment uh, could be on a repatriation basis or non-repatriation basis also so when an investment is in schedule one made into indian company it is always on a repatriation basis when the investment made under schedule four by non-resident indian in a llp or a partnership firm it is always on a non-repatriation basis and uh, when an investment made under schedule six on an indian capital of the llp it is always on a repatriation basis so schedule four is on a non-repatriation basis whereas schedule one and six are on a repatriation basis now when a when a transaction of a investment is carried out uh, there could be an issue of shares or it could be the 
transfer of shares also now this uh, transaction if you see historically from 2000 1992 to 2000 and 2002 2020 has been in both the area in fti also and in the portfolio investment also when a foreign direct investment or a foreign investment is open for the non-resident generally it is an attempt of the government to invite more fdi than the portfolio investment because fdi is generally of a long-term nature whereas portfolio investment will be of a short-term nature and therefore uh, though non-residents are attracted towards portfolio investment the government would like to attract fdi and how these fdis are regulated by government of india you know when a sector or an industry is open to the non-resident the general consideration is uh, three types of considerations are uh, required the one is whether there is enough experience of the domestic player in a particular sector the second is whether, whether the industry is of a strategic nature and which or it requires a protection whether the industry is of a hazardous nature and the uh, remaining sector basically so where sector requires protection generally that will be opened up last so like uh, retail trading it will never be opened up so easily by the government it will be always the last priority to open that particular sector because that industry is one which government want to protect the industry of strategic importance like arms and munitions like um, atomic energy railways etc are of a strategic importance generally uh, that will also be the second last priority to open such industry still uh, today also uh, atomic energy and the railways are still the priority of the government of india and then, and that is not open to even private player in india so there is no question of opening it to the non resident then hazardous industries automatically uh, will be restricted because that disturbs the uh, environment of the country and one of the location where it is put up and the remaining uh, items like uh, when we see the industry where there is no enough domestic experience if such is the situation then these particular industries will not be open to non-resident immediately because in those areas the domestic player will never be able to have their business and therefore the sectors like banking sectors the insurance sectors were the second last priorities for opening up and therefore we have uh, private sector banking and public sector banking insurance guideline where uh, initially it was only 26 percent now it is made 49 percent and about 49 percent is the is the wow. approval required by the government of india now this this uh, background has been incorporated in the non-debt uh, regulations of uh, 2019 and prior to that uh, it was included in the fema notification 20 until when the government of india took over the prerogative of uh, making regulations for the capital account transactions so therefore we have the overall uh, regulatory framework which is industrial development regulation act 1951 which gives rise the power to government of india to open up the particular to open up the particular sector and then there is a delegated legislation legislation which uh, empowers ministry of industry and commerce to open up those industries for the investment by the non resident which were found in the consolidated FDI policy and the mirror is found in the NDA rules now. Earlier it was found in the notification 20 of the FEMA. So we have overall framework uh, of the Industrial Development Regulation Act with the delegated legislation which is found in non-debt rules and FEMA now provides only for the 
reporting requirements and uh, those are the uh, function of the Reserve Bank of India and the which is which is particularly again delegated to the authorized dealer. So you are making almost all documentation with the authorized dealer. Now it comes to the that how these regulations uh, are framed. The regulations are framed in a manner that Indian uh, entity will not be able to invite any investment unless permitted and foreigner will not or a non-resident will not make any investment in the Indian entity unless it is uh, permitted. So uh, before we go to the uh, regulation, let us first understand the few definitions. Now we, as you know, that the Schedule One uh, deals with the investment in the companies. Schedule uh, Four investment in partnership firm and the LLP on a non-repetition basis, and uh, Schedule Six again LLP on a non-repetition basis. Now uh, these definitions are the general definitions. Uh, applicable to the entire uh, gamut of regulation, not only a particular schedule. So there are one to ten schedule, but before we go to the schedule, there are general regulations which are applicable to all the schedules. Now, therefore, the definition of equity instruments. It is nothing but all the instruments representing the equity capital in the company is defined as the equity instrument therefore when it comes to llp it is a membership share when it comes to company it can be equity shares it can be convertible preference shares it will be convertible debentures it will be share warrants it will be partly paid shares etc so so therefore uh, this is the equity instrument then indian entity it could be company or an llp or a partnership firm but uh, Partnership firm, there is no there is no entry route available for the non-resident on a repatriation basis. Therefore, Indian entity where repatriation is permitted is only company and the LLP. Then the foreign investment. There are a couple of uh, confusing words. They have defined uh, foreign investment and foreign direct investment separately. They are saying if investment is made as per Schedule 1 in the Indian companies, then it is a foreign direct investment. But if it is if it is made in a company as well as in the capital of the LLP, then it will be a foreign investment. So when we are talking of the investment in the LLP, then it is the foreign investment, but not foreign direct investments. That is how they have defined. It doesn't make any difference as such. But when we use the words foreign direct investment, it is referring to the only Indian company and not the LLP. But when we use the terminology foreign investment, it is referring to both the instrument of an Indian company or the capital of the LLP. So that's how uh, this is particular terminology has been used. The por portfolio investment we have already discussed. Sectoral cap. You know, when we when a foreigner is allowed to make investment, then we have already understood the background of the Industrial Development Regulation Act and the relaxation of the licensing. That the sectoral cap is the mechanism through which the entire background has been incorporated into the sectoral cap that a particular non-resident will be permitted to invest in an Indian company only up to a percentage of equity instrument and not more. That means where the participation or the experience of the domestic player is lower, the percentage of ceiling will be lower. And slowly those percentage of ceiling will be relaxed once one once uh, we look at that the domestic participant is much larger. Let's say today, the, when we talk about the retail trading, the current uh, entire business of a retail trading, 
if we if we were to do the statistical analysis then only 10 to 12 percent of the retail trading business is in the organized sector so if 10 to 12 percent business is only in the organized sector which also which is only with the large player then it is very difficult for the government to open up such a sector so easily and therefore we have a restricted um, single brand retail trading policy and the uh, multi brand retail trading investment policies that's that's a sectoral cap basically currently we have uh, still a restricted policy on insurance sector where only 49% is permitted in the uh, insurance company whereas of course uh, if they are intermediaries of the insurance companies then you are permitted 100% like a insurance broker and such intermediaries and then the performance conditions see when when you open up the industry like uh, retail trading then there are certain conditions put on such retailers where with the foreign investment what are those um, conditions like that they must actually uh, do some favor to the economy by establishing the backward infrastructures to the agro sector minimum investment in multiple retail trading will be 100 uh, million dollar etc etc there thus multiple retail trading stores could be only in the outskirts of the uh, cities etc so these are the performance conditions which are linked with the uh, particular sector only so in if you if you were to invest in that sector then you have to follow those performance conditions so so these are the these are called um, performance link conditions of the fdi so this is how the the main definitions are now then we go to the rules that this th regulation 3 and 4 are the prohibitions that what is permitted under the regulation can only be done otherwise nothing can be done so this is about the roots of investment that having understood the background what are the roots of investment one route is called automatic route another is called approval route what the the law of schedule one and the law of the investment of uh, regulation 19 nda rules provides it says these are the prohibited activities it says this is the sector Role capped on each sector. If you invest up to that sector and do proper paperwork, then you are permitted to make investment, and you are only required to submit documentation. Then so that that particular route is called an automatic route. However, if you are investing more than the ceiling percentage, but up to the percentage specified by the government of India, then you go to the government of india let's say for example if you were to invest up to 20 percent in the public sector banking then up to 20 percent you have to go to government approval only that is not on an automatic basis then there are certain industries in the financial services infrastructure market that the 49 percent can only be invested let's say stock exchange the non-resident cannot invest more than 49 percent as a policy but if you invest want to invest more than 14 percent then uh, you do approach government so these are the sector specific guidelines that if you follow the simple schedule one rule where sectoral cap on each particular activity is specified if you are following that particular percentage ceiling and follow the uh, paperwork which is specified in the law what is the paperwork is very simple you make investment as per the conditions of the schedule one what are those conditions very simple that it is it has to be a company what is the capital instrument what is the eligible entities what are the eligible non-residents what is the sector how many percentage you are investing whether you have followed pricing guideline and then if you follow these uh, simple conditions then file the prescribed forms you don't need to go to anyone and you can make investment in the indian company so these are the 
oral regulations chapter 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 now these chapters are comprising of both portfolio investment as well as fdi investors we are only concerned with the we are only concerned with regulation 6 investment by person resident outside india fdi schedule 1 and we are also concerned with investment by nri and oci and transfer of equity instrument by nri and oci schedule 4 on a non repatriation basis this is regulation 12 and 13 in chapter 5 and then lastly we are also concerned with the investment in the llp which is also part of regulation 6 6a is a company and 6b is the llp so Six covers schedule one as well as schedule six, and regulation twelve and thirteen covers schedule four on a non-repatriation basis. So we are co- concerned with six, twelve, and thirteen regulation only. The rest of the regulations are in relation to the, as I mentioned, most of them are in the portfolio nature. Why portfolio nature? Schedule two is FII investment on stock exchange. Schedule three. is a investment by non resident on stock exchange schedule 4 we are covering schedule 5 is sovereign fund schedule 6 we are covering as llp 7 is fvci foreign venture capital investor so they are not invest interested in fdi they are interested in the return of investments only then we have um, aifs uh, depository receipts and fccb all are in the nature where investor is generally not interested in participating into the management and control of the business but they are interested in the return on investment so those are specifically today excluded for the purpose of discussion and therefore we are concerned with only 6 12 and 13 this is uh, we have already seen the issue of shares are so easy you know that company is obligated to issue shares and therefore company is supposed to do the uh, reg- related paperwork to be submitted to the authorized dealer but when there is a transfer of equity instrument there are three parties covered you know the three party which are covered is company transferer and transferee so transferer and transferee is obligated to do the paperwork with the authorized dealer but the company is to ensure that when they transfer the share this paper has work has been carried out so so therefore and also a transfer is typically a transaction which uh, has a variety of uh, options when issue of shares can be only uh, for payment or for uh, in kind when dues company has to pay to the non resident then again those dues also the shares can be issued but beyond that there is nothing but when you talk about transfer of shares it could be by sale it could be by sale on stock exchanges it could be by gift it could be by um it could be by uh, inheritance also so gift and inheritance and purchase all three are covered in transfer of shares and these transfer of shares could be of a variety of uh, nature because when you issue the shares you are issuing to the non resident but when you transfer the shares it could be resident to non resident it could be non resident to resident and it could be non resident to non resident also all three transactions are covered and therefore the regulation of issue of shares and transfer of equity instrument would be slightly different and the reporting requirement also therefore will be slightly different and these regulations are very obvious i have given in a tabular form but just to understand you know like you and you take at the last item nri and oci holding shares on a non repatriation basis and want to gift right to another nri oci on a non repatriation basis they are transferring by gift nri to nri we are not we are not concerned because no foreign exchange is lost by the government of india but when a when a second last transaction transaction number 5 when person in india 
holding on and on repatriation basis want to give shares to person resident outside india we are losing a lot of foreign exchange because this asset hitherto was held as a resident asset is now becoming a non resident asset and therefore there will be rules and there will be restriction on such transfers it could be only with the relatives so that bona fide is established up front so if you see this table it's very simple and i made it uh, in a long list of uh, regulation into one table for your understanding so we will not discuss this just to you know give a give a broad uh, overview so that uh, when you read it is very very clear to you uh, and it is, you don't have to remember also because uh, if you understood the logic of the law then you don't require really the further understanding so this is about um, transfer of shares now you know uh, under fema even pledge is considered as transfer and therefore the pledge is also covered here then um, equity instrument could be uh, transferred by virtue of uh, deferred payment also like uh, when a company issues a shares a partly paid shares then there will be deferred payment if similarly transfer of share could also be on a deferred basis because there are due diligence carried out time taken by due diligence agencies etc and escrow is also created therefore so so these regulations do provide for the deferred payment consideration the pledge of shares as well as the opening of the escrow mechanism and there are attendant conditions so that transactions are again falling within the automatic route of the transfer now there are the reporting requirements now what the what the law says the nda rules 2019 says that the entire rule making authority is with the government of india whereas the reporting requirement will be carried out by the reserve bank of india so reserve bank of india has uh, come out with the system of uh, online reporting where you have to register your indian company on online basis on an online portal called uh, entity master and then there is a smpf portal where a single uh, window of reporting a transaction when a shares are issued it is reported in fc gpr form when a shares are transferred it is reported in fc trs form we already understood that why uh, this two different form when the isops are issued then it is in the form isop uh, which is also in the same master file it is covered then in case of a llp you file form llp1 and in case of a disinvestment from the llp you file form llp2 because here there is no you know there is transfer here there is no transfer here uh, it is a retirement or assignment of share in llp and therefore uh, form our llp1 and llp2 instead of fc gpr and fc trs then um, there is also form when a uh, downstream investment is made and there is also a separate form when convertible note is issued by the startup company in india and a separate form is prescribed when a unit has been issued by the investment vehicle we are not concerned with the units of a investment vehicle and convertible notes but we are definitely uh, dealing with llp1 llp2 fc trs fc gpr and form di we will take up this di little later when we come to downstream investment now what is a downstream investment we have understood that schedule 1 refers to the investment in the indian company schedule 4 refers to investment in partnership firm and llps by non resident on a non repatriation basis and schedule 6 means uh, investment by a non resident in llp on a repatriation basis now when we concern with the indian company the indian company could have a downstream company so indian company which is a downstream company is one is, is the one which is dealing with the a particular activity as defined in the sectoral policy the government of india so when a investment is made by non resident in an indian company 
which is not engaged in any activity, but it's downstream company, second company, level two company is engaged in the sector, then certainly we are concerned with the what is the investment in sectoral company. We are not concerned with what is investment made in the level one company, right? So, so therefore, uh, complexity arises. Then how to what what type of complexity arises? That how to you know calculate that how many percentage you have invested in the level two company? How to value the investment when you are making investment in level one company? But you have to calculate the percentage of equity in level two company. What is the value? Whether the what can be done by level one company and level two company. So in order to frame regulations for downstream uh, entities, three or four uh, different concepts uh, has been you know coined. And the number one is level one company. Number two is a uh, level two company. Number three is total foreign investment, direct and indirect in the level two company, because that is what we are concerned. Then they have invoked a concept called an Indian company, which is level one company, controlled and owned by resident Indian citizens. And second concept that the Indian level one company is controlled or managed by the non-resident entity. So these are the concept which are uh, you know introduced to to clear out the confusion uh, which may arise because of the the investment in level one company but the sectoral activity is carried out by the level two company. So let us look at how uh, these regulations are working. Say you know case one so the law says if the foreign investor has invested of 49 percent from zero to 14 percent in the level one company and level two company has invested 100 percent in a sectoral entity which is indian entity then they say that indirect foreign investment in the second level company will be treated as zero there is no foreign direct investment in the sectoral company level two in case two this is if it is more than 50% invested by non resident in the level 1 company and level 1 company invested 40% in the sectoral entity then this investment indirect foreign investment in level 2 company will be treated as 40% same way case 4 if you look at 75% by foreign investment in entity 1 and 100% in the indian company then this will be treated as 100%. Whereas in case three, where the foreign investor invested is 100% in the Indian company and 35% in the sectoral entity, then that investment will be treated as only 35%. So this is this is the case three is an exception. It, it What it says that if I have invested 100%, but out of that money, only 35% invested in the level two company, then my investment cannot be considered as more than 35% as a foreign direct investment what it says is the level two company may have the direct investment from the non-resident investor also so the, that equity will be traded as 65 percent and this will be 35 percent so total foreign investment in the level two company would be direct investment into the entity plus the indirect investment into the entity both together would constitute the ceiling specified in the sectoral entity I think um, this is the very simple uh, concept. But uh, if you read downstream investment in the regulation uh, 23 onwards, it is very, very clumsily worded and very confusing. So if you refer to these slides, I think uh, you will not go wrong anywhere. Then there are certain conditions that uh, the Indian um, company level one cannot have a leveraged fund utilized for the level two company. It can only have profits or a foreign direct investment from abroad that can only be utilized. So, so then, then, then there are 
number of issues which i have only specified a simple issue to drive concept of the indirect shareholding but there could be more than two level one companies there could be three or four layers of downstream investment then what it says is you have to calculate downstream investment at each and every level of investment and you have to comply with the ceiling condition sectoral cap condition at each entry point it could be level 2 level 3 level 4 no no matter and that's the law for the downstream investment and again um it says that fctrs fcgpr everything will have to be filed for level 2 companies and obligation of filing such form is on level 1 company and this uh, compliance has to be informed in the form di to the government of india and this has to be that this law has been complied with has been has to be audited by the company auditor and it should be it is to be included in the report of the directors if there are non compliances so this is not coming out from the company law so you have to be very careful that this requirement is fulfilled by the company if not if the compliance certificate is not obtained from the auditor then you have some problem in uh, dealing with these issues so this is about the uh, overall uh, reporting requirement on the indirect uh, investment cases now we go to acquisition and transfer of immol property in india again this is part of um, not uh, schedule 1 so we will take it up little later if time permits otherwise we will directly go to the overall uh, non debt instrument rules so these are again i am repeated i have repeated the schedules but we are concerned with only schedule 1 4 and 6 so we go to this is you know pictorially i have represented that foreign direct investments are covered in schedule 1 9 and 6 6 is llp schedule 1 is company similarly foreign portfolio investment is covered in schedule 3 and schedule 2 foreign venture capital is in schedule 7 ncd is an etc now uh, coming under the debt rules and uh, on non repatriation basis onri and osi is only permitted in schedule 4 so this is basically an overall chart we are not concerned with the overall but just to give you an overview that where we are placed in this particular uh, scenario is what we can you know point out and we can understood holistically that uh, these are portfolios are separately covered but portfolio can be of a different nature and the fdi could be of a different nature again uh, schedule for foreign investment uh, define detail explain in detail these are the instruments equity instrument share warrants etc schedule wise what is permitted and what is not permitted and foreign direct investment could be of a brownfield or a greenfield greenfield means issue of share and brownfield means transfer of shares schedule 1 4 and 6 um uh, madam uh, dusty madam uh, how long i have to continue and how much time i have uh so you can continue because i think you started also late so if you have uh, how many more slides do you have no no my, i will complete uh, there is no problem because my slides are up to 57 only and thereafter i have only given illustrative example so the law will be okay, complete okay. so but just to okay. you know so according i have my speed yeah. that's why <laughs> asking it yeah, yeah you can continue for 15 15 minutes or so 15 20 minutes no issues all right perfect no problem okay so uh, we have understood the law on an uh, overall basis that the there is a government policy within the policies of uh, government government has defined sectors within sectors what non resident can invest up to what ceiling is specified in uh, in these regulations right and uh, how these sectors have been uh, you know selected that also we have understood the rational behind uh, this particular uh, sectoral uh, ceiling and uh, we also understood as to that there are performance conditions on each sector 
if you are following in a e-commerce then you have to follow certain regulation that you e-commerce does not become retail trading right so those performance can be then if you are in a wholesale trading then it has to be wholesale trading only you cannot supply to consumers so these are the these type of situations are different for each sector so those 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 conditions are the sectoral conditions performance conditions so schedule one we will go to schedule one now when you go to uh, schedule one we are concerned with the only entity as indian company so what is what are we concerned with eligible entity what is the eligible entity indian company then eligible instruments what is eligible instrument capital instrument we already seen the definition of capital instrument then what is the third eligible persons who are the eligible persons the persons other than the citizen of pakistan and entities of pakistan bangladesh citizen entities only with the prior approval of government so this is eligible persons what are the eligible sector again uh, which are mentioned in the regulation up to up to the particular percentage of the selling what you can do you can issue share or you can transfer shares then uh, you know what is transfer when you when you issue share you can issue shares against money or against the incorporation expenses or against the dues let's say some import of machinery has been carried out by the indian company from the non resident investor so these are the dues which are valid dues right so valid dues you can issue the capital also and when it when there is an existing company there could be transfer of shares also and such transfer could be in cash such transfer could be in kind such transfer could be swap of shares also and um, it could be conversion of ecb into shares then such transfer of shares could involve escrow mechanism and deferred payment also so all these conditions are mentioned in schedule 1 then schedule 1 also talks about the pricing guideline very simple what it says if a shares are issued to the non resident or if a transfer you the share is a non resident then they must pay up the amount which is more than the valuation price and converse is true if non resident is selling the shares to the resident then resident must pay lower than the valuation price you know again very logic logical that government we should not lose the foreign exchange unnecessarily unreasonably if you are making a lower price you are fine you are making uh, if you are taking a higher price from the non resident you are fine of course it may be contradicting certain other law uh, particularly the income tax act the section 562 7a 7b and now 56 to 10 uh, they are all operating differently against fema so that uh, one has to uh, look into basically then uh, as we have seen that the sector could be 100% allowed because it is free for all no prior experience was lacking let's say if you go for a manufacturing sector manufacturing of uh, other than other than arms ammunition railways automatic energies etc then 100% uh, equity by the non resident is allowed if you are let us say uh, engaged in the production of chemicals then uh, if you are engaged in the pharmaceuticals and uh, it's a green field then 100% is allowed on an automatic basis so these are these sectors are specified in this regulation itself with the conditions but we will not go into the entire sector by sector because only sectoral policy can 3 hours to explain you know but i have given you the reading material from slide 57 onwards which we will not discuss we will just say one one line there uh, and hold there for a minute and understand that this is the entire sectoral policy just to give a flavor that what is the flavor of this sectoral policy so this is about the the automatic route of investment that if your pricing gu guidelines are followed if sectoral policy is followed if uh, eligible 
persons eligible con, con, eligible companies and uh, and the eligible non resident investor guidelines are followed then your investment is in accordance with schedule 1 and therefore it is known as an automatic route of investment and there simply after receiving the investment you file form fcgpr or fcprs as the case may be and no need for going for the prior approval but any of this condition let us say for example you are make inviting investment from the bangladesh citizens and entity then you have to go to fipb here i want to mention the recent development on 17th april 2020 the government has restricted the investment from the countries and the citizens who are sharing borders with the government of india we all know that this was specifically done to avoid um, avoid the cheap sale of the indian assets to the neighboring competing countries and particularly uh, china now uh, government has opened up uh, that investment uh, on a case to case basis but still that restriction do is, is still there but there is no amendment in the law so far and therefore that is by way of press note and is continuing like that for last one year so therefore uh, that is a prohibited investment and therefore prohibited investment you cannot do with the government approval also but here it is very clearly mentioned that bangladesh citizens and entities only with prior approval have you that means their investment will be permitted but no automatic route government approval only right so therefore uh, if you have complied with uh, eligible persons condition no issues similarly uh, let us say for example the price at which your non resident is purchasing the shares is lower than the valuation price then most of the other conditions are satisfied but the lower price condition is not satisfied price condition is not satisfied in those cases you will have to again go to the government of india because pricing guideline is not followed similarly uh, let's say for example when a non resident want to buy the shares of a indian company from a stock exchange by transfer of share that is right then it cannot do so under schedule 1 as an fdi transaction unless they are already in the control of the indian company if they are not under the control of the indian company and they still want to buy shares for some reason which are which which makes sense on an overall uh, investment basis they will have to go to um, they will have to go to government of india for the approval so these are the situation which does not fall within the parameters of schedule 1 and therefore you are directed to go to the government of india for the approval and you know there is a uh, portal called um, facilitation portal uh, foreign investment facilitation foreign direct investment facilitation portal ff uh, website and etc i have given you go there submit your application there is a standard operating procedure according to the standard operating procedure within 8 to 10 weeks there are steps Uh, followed by the government internally they are mentioned there in the policy and within 8 to 10 weeks with the approval of the respective uh, agencies involved in the government uh, you will have your approval on the website without referring to anybody so that's the uh, government route basically automatic route and the government route eligible investment entities but we are only covered with the indian companies in schedule 1 right limited liability partnership in schedule 6 and partnership firm proprietary under in schedule 4 rest of the uh, investment vehicle we are not we, we are not concerned today then uh, i have just given us stock the items where you require only government approval because under automatic route uh, they don't want at all uh, civil aviation satellites telecom private security agencies multi brand um, trading etc beyond certain percentage they don't want you to go in the automatic route so therefore uh, you go to the fifp.government.in portal uh, follow the government will follow the sop 
and they will give you the approval now uh, this was issue and transfer of shares bonus shares are also allowed to be issued on an automatic basis under all situations issue of rise share again pricing guideline to be followed the shares to be issued to non resident should not be at the lower price than the uh, issued to the resident etc amalgamation and merger if the merging entity or the merge entity a uh, resultant entity is uh, following the uh, sectoral and the schedule one guideline you don't need any audi approval you can go ahead with the automatic route but if there is a change in any of the parameters of schedule one you again go to the go for the prior approval then now there are isop and uh, other modes of uh, issue of shares then payment how payment will be made escrow conversion of payables conversion of other dues payments deferred payments are the uh, requirement now what are the category where the investment is completely prohibited this is the this is the regulation 2 of schedule 1 we have completed regulation 1 fully there are three or four regulations within the schedule 1 but they are very large so this is gambling cheat fund nidhi real estate manufacturing cigars atomic energy and railways these are not permitted this even if the government approval with the government approval this activities will not be permitted so no need to approach government of india for any of these activities also if you see the facilitation portal that uh, within the sectoral policy in certain sectors even the state should also permit those sector they based on the location in which you want to start those activities particularly in the single brand retail trading many of the states have not approved the government policy on single brand retail trading so there therefore in those states if you start single brand it will not be permitted because you are required to uh, get the license from the state government also and state government has not agreed with the government of india and most of the time i have seen that uh, if the central government have formulated this policy and state government is required to consent then the government with the same political parties have agreed immediately and government with the friendly parties also have agreed but unfriendly parties have not agreed so that is the uh, unwritten law on these areas the fema and the valuation we already discuss about the valuation that um if it is a listed company you know valuation is as per the sebi guidelines the preferential allotment guideline and sebi merchant banker valuation but if it is a unlisted company then uh, it is a valuation by chartered accountant or the merchant banker and it should be in accordance with the internationally accepted pricing methodology for uh, transfer of shares same procedure again the transaction can be done at a price lower than the valuation or higher than the valuation as the case may be and um, other important conditions are caps entry conditions downstream etc a short return on exit of foreign investors now you see you have invested certain certain foreign investors will say no 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 i i am very skeptical making investment in india and therefore uh, i made an assured return whether such assured return is possible now see there are various methods of uh, disinvestment first of transfer of shares to the resident promoter or third party or um, say buyback of shares under the um, transfer of shares regulation 2014 of uh, company law then um, then there is a assured price by the company itself there is a huge uh, litigation in this area the most it started with the tata docomo and the uptown the akruti builders where um, tata docomo was offered the downward protection of the price that you will not that we will assure you at least half the price of the shares as per the valuation and when the share were valued the value was almost uh, nil and the half the price half the investment price was double than the valuation price it went on to various courts intervention of supreme court singapore arbitration and finally delhi high court said that no 
downward protection is not the uh, assured price uh, protection so therefore the tata must pay to the foreign investor docomo the 50% of the price which was agreed and it was treated as a liquidated damage is not the assured return similarly um, similarly the other idba trustee versus uptown then the cruise city one mauritius uh, versus uh, unitec what we are finding that the decision of the courts are contrary to the assured price mechanism therefore one has to be careful as to how uh, you have to play safe based on these decisions i don't want to go into the detail but i just wanted to throw some light on assured price versus because assured price it cannot be made payment because the payment and disinvestment has to be in accordance with the pricing policy as stated in the schedule 1 now we come to the investment on a non repatriation basis you know um that uh, non resident indian and the oci card holders are only allowed to invest on a non repatriation basis and they are allowed to invest in the partnership firm proprietary concern and in the llp on a non repatriation basis no foreigners or a foreigners with the non indian origin are not permitted to invest on a non repatriation basis because the government uh, has been skeptical about it that why a non resident of a non indian origin would like to invest into india on a non repatriation basis and therefore it's a policy decision not to permit a non resident of a non non indian origin not to invest on a non repatriation basis so very simply said that these investment will be treated as a deemed domestic investment as if it is invested by another resident indian and therefore all these what you have followed and observed in schedule 1 of uh, regulation 19 nda rules 19 is not applicable to this particular schedule no valuation no sectoral cap no ceiling except three or four items will not be permitted this is nothing but um, uh, trading in real estate uh nidhi company and chit fund and tdr activities are not permitted all rest of the activities are permitted and that is about the uh investment by nris on a non repatriation basis schedule 4 non debt rules 2019 here the payment can be made from nro account or an nri account but it will not be allowed to be repatriated abroad you all know that the all current income whether the investment is held on a repatriation or a non repatriation basis are repatriable that means even if investment is on a non repatriation basis all current income is allowed to be repatriated abroad in addition to the 1 million dollar scheme available to non resident of course that will not include any capital gains and uh, share of profit from the firms which has capital gains nature of capital gains all current income dividend interest rental income will be permitted even if the investment is on a non repatriation basis so this is about um, nri investing into india so basically any entity is abroad which is predominantly owned by a non resident or an oci card holder will be permitted to invest in indian companies proprietary concerns and llps on a non repatriation basis so this is the uh, implication which i have already stated again um, when you are not following the valuation rules and etc 562 which is a prominent section of income tax law will also have to be uh, looked into for your safety because no even non resident or an any anybody is uh, receiving the shares by transfer of shares at a price lower than the fair valuation as prescribed in 562 rule 11 or whatever then uh, such transaction will be looked into by the tax authorities so now we come to the uh, llp very simple this is a repatriation basis earlier there was no llp 
and therefore investment in llp was not uh, introduced in the fdi it was introduced only in 2011 and major liberalization in 2015 because uh, llp in the initial uh, era was not permitted to have a downstream investment secondly uh, it was not permitted to accept ecbs etc today also if uh, there is a performance link uh, criteria in a sector then the downstream investment is not permitted ecb is permitted wherever fdi is permitted so if there is a downstream investment with a per performance condition then ecb will also be a difficult situation so again the only important issue in llp is how do you value your capital and the profit share whether you value capital also or you value profit share also whether you value both or you don't value anything a resident is investing 50% non resident investing is 50% he is investing 50000 rupees you are investing equivalent of 50000 rupees is it something fair and reasonable or you need to invest uh, you need to value look um, the concept of shares and concept of uh, capital is different because the when a profit is earned the capital will be credited whereas whereas in the company capital is not credited capital remains the same here capital fluctuates with the in profit earning capacity of the llp and therefore i would like to think that it's not simple it's more complicated uh, you may design your capital separately and the profit share separately and value the profit share and keep the capital as fixed i think the life is very, will be very simple and uh, fine that uh, capital be returned as it is with or without interest as per the llp deed and the uh, share of profit be computed each time when there is a event of investment and disinvestment and it dealt with accordingly so that's that's my view on the llp valuations and etc the performance sectors i have just specified here so that you understand that if it is a performance related uh, sector then downstream investment is not permitted and fdi is also permitted on a 100% automatic basis where there is a no performance is required so these are now from slide 56 are the issues i have raised now profit share of llp how to value i have already uh, discussed now reporting requirement llp1 and llp2 30 days and 60 days similarly fctrs 60 days and fcgpr is 30 days whether import of goods services etc uh, like indian company was uh, able to do whether same thing can be done in llp or not because schedule 6 does not uh, specify capitalization of it so whether will you be able to do it or not these are the issues which i have mentioned here just for your understanding and a better reading but uh, i don't need to go through this because i have explained it very clearly uh, with the background of the technical materials the regulation the press notes wherever the press note is um, still valid what are the issues in uh, you know direct and indirect foreign investment when a foreign citizen who is a indian resident is investing in the level 1 company <laughs> because level 1 is not regulated but automatically because the first company is controlled by the foreign citizen level 2 is regulated so such a such a design is possible or not whether such was intended see i have just made out the issues for your better understanding then uh, fti um, into the property when you go to the property regulation 23 to 25 which we will come little later the time for me escrow mechanism i already explained fdi in various sectors you know e-commerce there are performance condition so that the e-commerce fellow does not enter into a single brand retail trading These are the therefore the guideline. If you read in that background, you will understand this guideline and additional conditions also. Then defense sector. That what is the policy on defense sectors? What are the performance conditions? What are the different approvals required and why? Broadcasting and print media. See, the print media does not cover digital media. Does not cover social media. So a lot of uh, uh, agencies from abroad 
are collecting news from india and putting in their uh, social media whether such things were intended or not whether such policy will be required to be modified or the policy will uh, also applied to such digital uh, news from fdi in many so manufacturing is defined but there is some confusion between brand retail trading as well as the brand being owned by an indian resident who is citizen so i have just highlighted that issue here fdi in real now uh, i i will first go to yeah real estate this is again um, sectoral cap is provided as 100% but there are some performance condition what is the performance condition that uh, there will be lock in period of 3 years and uh, these are mall infrastructures and etc construction fdi only there cannot be buying and selling of the properties in this particular area or there cannot be buying and selling of tdr but one interesting uh, element they have introduced in the last uh, policy change is that said that if a large mall infrastructure is purchased for the purpose of yielding the rent earning the rent then such activity would not constitute trading in the real estate so they have also said what will not amount to transfer of the asset here uh, it will amount to only lease so that particular activity of a mall purchase and lease is permitted modern uh, infrastructures then the urban infrastructure uh, then the construction etc is permitted here without any um, investment criteria but lock in period of 3 year is permitted but this lock in period of 3 year is not applicable to non resident indian and the oci card holder very clearly mentioned in the policy on fdi in real sector itself now we go to the uh, slide uh, regulation uh, on property which we have said we will come back to that regulation little later and discuss about the property situation in india yes acquisition of properties see this is this is a very uh, interesting topic of property in india see you are allowed to purchase property on an individual basis a person resident outside india who is a citizen of india right and also foreign company and long term visa holder but no company in india is permitted to purchase the property only individuals are required to purchase the can can purchase the property under this regulation 24 to 23 is not part of schedule 146 but it is intimately linked with the fdi in real estate sector just i will take five more minutes to explain this concept this is very complex topic so i thought uh, i will take up this that uh, you know that schedule 1 permits fdi in real estate sector with the performance conditions that lock in of 3 years that it it the it should be in accordance with the local regulations it should not be real estate uh, develop uh, development rights trading or it should not be buying and selling of the properties but it is a construction fdi only and that will not include uh, development of agricultural farm and plantations also now in that uh, sector non resident is permitted without the lock in period but again construction fdi now here this is not a construction fdi this is only a purchase of uh, residential or a commercial property in india only nris and oci card holders are permitted to invest in the residential and the commercial property in india now they can purchase individually but there could be various mode of acquisition of immobile properties they have devised the property into two part all the properties which includes agricultural properties and the properties which are other than the 
agricultural properties. If you are dealing with the immoral properties other than the agricultural property, law law is very much relaxed. That any OCI cardholder or NRIs can purchase the properties, no problem. Can acquire by way of a gift from relatives, no problem. Can acquire by inheritance, no problem. But if it comes to agricultural property, then it is only inheritance is permitted because that is a right enshrined in the Constitution of India. And that is a operation of the death and birth, not by the any other situation which can be controlled by the individual. So therefore, uh, it is if the property is agricultural, then if you want to sell it, it can be sold by non-resident can sell it only to person resident in India who is citizen of India, not even to another OCI card holder. So it is again logic of the law that if it comes to agricultural property, the law is this. If it comes to residential and commercial property, if it is not a gift, fine. If it is a gift, non-resident to non-resident, fine. Non-resident to resident, fine. But if the resident were to give gift to non-resident, then it has to be only relatives. It cannot be anybody else in order to check the bona fides. Then the long-term visa holder is now permitted to have the residential house in India. Then, uh, a foreign company uh, having a branch operation can take lease for five years and purchase property, but liaison office cannot. Then uh, seven uh, citizens of the countries, China, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Hong Kong, Macau, Afghanistan are not allowed to purchase any property in India. A very logic again, the government of India is fighting with billion dollars every year on a border. And how can you allow them to purchase the property in the center of Mumbai city or Delhi or anywhere else in India? So therefore, the policy is very, very logical. Of course, they have uh, introduced it through FEMA. They could have introduced to other law also. So transfer is a very simple purchase by cash or check through a banking channel only. Purchase cannot be done through a traveler's check or cash. And uh, repatriation of the property is permitted only up to two properties or more than two properties. Repatriation of profit is not permitted. Repatriation of the original sum is only permitted. So this was about the immobile property per se. Now this particular regulation, you cannot use it through a company or the company purchase of the property only by individuals. If you company, then you can fall in schedule one and company has to do business only. In schedule one is a foreign direct investment. It is not a bona fide purchase of the property. So no, lot of uh, many bankers are, you know, advising the non-resident that you please purchase property, give it on lease, I will give you a loan. I think that 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 is wrong. That is not permitted according to me. So that is about um, bona fide purchase of property by individuals. The business under schedule one, uh, the FDI policy that can be done by NRI and uh, non-resident both. This property can be purchased by NRI and OCA cardholder only. Then, uh, then the Schedule Four, Schedule Four NRIs are allowed to again invest in a partnership and LLP on a non-repetition basis. Again, the restriction of that particular schedule will apply, and restriction of uh, this schedule will not apply. So there are three windows for NRIs. Window in Schedule 1 transaction, window in regulations of immobile property from 24 to 31, and window in uh, non repatriation basis, Schedule 4, and window in LLP on a repatriation basis. That is all separate compartment. You must look at all compartment independently and separately. Please do not mix them. That's what my um, guidance to you on this matter, basically. So, that I think um, this uh, brings me to the almost uh, End of my presentation. If we go to the last slides where we have left, and probably it is almost end of the presentation. We have seen the e-commerce, broadcasting, manufacturing, single brand, real estate, yes. Overview. These I have covered all the three provisions here, you know. 
regulations, exit mechanism in all three portions. NBFC sector, again, there are performance conditions and the minimum capitalization criteria. And uh, if you are unregulated uh, non-banking non finance sector, then you have to go to the government of India for approval. Thank you very much for patient hearing, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, sir, for this uh, excellent presentation, uh, lovely material, and a very in-depth uh, dive into uh, uh, the you know FDI provisions. I think we have uh, highly, greatly uh, you know benefited from this session. Uh, may I now request my regional council colleague C H N Sintan Patel to propose a very well-deserved vote of thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Dashtriban. I think uh, first thanks to go to you for arranging and organizing the wonderful uh, seminar. This is something a topic which is very very relevant. And when the Parish Bhai himself is there as a faculty, I think it really creates a lot of impact on the participants. So my heartfelt thanks to Sir uh, Parish Bhai for sparing a valuable time. We understand and appreciate you sparing your time in these COVID challenges. And the way, sir, you explained this uh, very critical and very important uh, announcements and clear regulations is really appreciable because uh, since last two years, couple of years, uh, as you mentioned rightly in your schedule one, that China border issues are there. And on April 20, uh, on April 20, they have uh, raised some restrictions on that. And I think a lot of things are going on ups and downs on PEMA. So uh, understanding that issues and ensuring that they are able to provide us advice appropriate to the client is one of the most important thing and your experience uh, the way you share your experience is really uh, helpful to all of us and uh, your presentations slides, uh, slides everything will be useful to all of us so once again thank you from all the entire team of wrc for spending your time and we look forward to welcome you again again sir thank you so much thank you so much any question time is there i can um, definitely Happy to answer them if uh, I'm everyone. Sure there will be many questions, but I think since we have uh, overshot the time, we can mail you those questions. Sure. And Definitely. since we have the data of people who have posted those questions, we can send across our, our, your answers to them. Perfect. Thank you very much, sir. Pleasure. Pleasure meeting you all. Okay.